Thank you, colleagues. Uh, yesterday evening we had the return of members' business. This afternoon we have the return of opposition business. And the next item of business today is a Conservative Party debate uh, on motion 22636 in the name of Liam Kerr on the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill. Can I invite members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to be speak buttons now? And I call on Liam Kerr to speak to and move the motion. Twelve minutes, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we come to this debate on a motion which opens by acknowledging that we as a Parliament must address the pernicious and vile hate crimes that remain all too prevalent, and closes by proposing one possible solution which seeks to ensure this Parliament can pass a robust, unambiguous law that achieves what we all want it to, without serious unintended consequences. Now, the Government finds itself in something of an invidious position, having proposed a bill and no doubt in good faith sending it out for consultation with a view to improving and amending before introducing an effective and clear proscription on hate crime. And it's a bill proposed by a cabinet secretary whom I believe when he says he understands the lived experience of hate crime and has a deep desire to change that. I know he will want to get this right, as do we all. Yet around 2,000 people have responded to that consultation, which is the highest number of responses in this session of the Scottish Parliament. And although not all responses have been published yet, it is clear a significant number of those have raised serious concerns around the stirring up offences and the potential chilling effect on freedom of speech. Yet not exclusively, because there are also concerns around other aspects of the bill, just some of which I shall flag shortly. And these are all equally deserving of being aired, scrutinized and interrogated if we are to make good law which protects those impacted by hate crime. President officer, in late October, the Justice Committee will commence taking evidence from witnesses on their views on the draft bill, with members seeking to inform themselves of the key issues and likely amendments. It is intended that the committee will have interrogated all the points and the issues raised and bring us to stage one by late December. That is an extraordinary timetable for a bill that has produced an unprecedented number of responses. And as Fergus Ewing just said in the previous session, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Faced with the biggest crisis since the war, this parliament is making unprecedented decisions daily. And we just don't know how the pandemic will impact our operations over the next four months. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. For giving away. Just a point of clarification, because obviously I, I'm not on uh, the Justice Committee. Did he not know the scale or the number of submissions that had, he had received before he agreed to the timetable as outlined by the Justice Committee? Liam Kerr. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for the intervention. I'm not sure we did. I'm not sure we know uh, exactly yet because of the sheer volume of the submissions and that I understand a number of the individual ones uh, might be collated because they might say similar things. So we don't know the exact volume of responses that uh, we're going to be dealing with. And my point, which I will come on to make clear later, is that with such a heavy focus on part two of the draft bill, uh, there is a serious danger of not doing justice to the other parts of the bill and ensuring the effective scrutiny. And I listened to the Cabinet Secretary on GMS this morning, and I, I think, in a, perhaps inadvertently, Cabinet Secretary made my point for me, uh, because he was interrogated about this bill, and of course ended up spending most of the time, for understandable reasons, talking about the chilling effect of the stirring up offences in part two. And I, as, as I will make that point later in my submission, uh, I think that is a real risk that arises from this bill. Because going back to the context that I set up, presiding officer, about the, the burden on the committee. Uh, that is the context that weighs very heavily on my mind as I consider the legislation before us. The First Minister told us in the programme for government, we need to ensure we have laws in this country that are capable of tackling hate crime because it is pernicious and horrible and we should have zero tolerance for it. And she is right. And we must do all we can to ensure that the first part of this law, which deals with the statutory aggravations, is not only capable of tackling hate crime, but does so completely and unambiguously. And that means subjecting the draft bill to intense scrutiny. To ask whether simply consolidating is the right approach, or might there be merit in the approach 
adopted in New Zealand or Canada to be concerned with forms of hatred based on any differences in characteristics. To ask what about the exclusion of sex? I think the suggestion that such exclusions could be seen to send a message that sex-based hatred is of lesser importance compared to the other characteristics is worth exploring. To ask whether the working group to consider an offence of misogynistic harassment is the best way to proceed on this. Because, for example, the Law Society say that if the policy intention is for the list of characteristics to mirror those in the Equality Act 2010, there is merit in including sex at this stage. To ask whether issues of misogyny and indeed misandry are too important to be left to secondary legislation. It's been suggested that substantive changes to criminal law must be included in primary legislation where the policy intentions can be fully and publicly debated. Yes. Thank the member for taking the intervention. Would the member agree that women's organisations and equality organisations are supportive of a standalone uh, looking at a standalone offence? Liam Kerr. Uh, yes, I would. I, I think there's, well, from what I've looked at, uh, and the member I, I'm sure will agree with this, there is a broad range of opinion on this. Uh, and that's exactly my point, Rona Mackay, is we need to be having that debate. We need to be considering what's the right thing to do in relation to a sex-based aggravator. And should that be part of the bill? Should it be considered by a working group? Should it be brought back later? Or should it be dealt with now in primary legislation? Uh, similar concerns have been raised on the definitions, such as those in part three, on the inclusion of variations of sex characteristics. DSD families, which supports children of families with difference of sex development, state singling out a biological condition in this way reinforces stigma rather than working towards understanding and societal acceptance. This is a highly sensitive area involving rare medical conditions and its consideration must not be rushed. And finally, despite the stated aim of clarifying and modernising legislation and Lord Brackadell's recommendation, part one uses archaic language, such as evince malice and ill will. Now, the Law Society specifically suggests that the argument that this wording is needed to ensure no change to the aggravation threshold is not particularly convincing. Are they right? I don't know. But that is why parliamentary scrutiny will be so important. President Officer, this bill contains welcome and important proposals, but those parts are not without potentially serious challenges, which must be aired, debated and amended if we are to ensure proper protection against hate crime. But if you look at the published submissions, if you look at articles written on this bill, if you look at the commentaries, the overwhelming focus is on the stirring up hatred offences. And what many groups and individuals from across Scotland have said will have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. Now, I know colleagues across the chamber are going to express their concerns on this area, so I, I won't explore these in depth at this stage. Suffice to say, there seems to be a very real concern held by a significant number of those making submissions to this consultation, including the Law Society, the Faculty of Advocates, the Scottish Police Federation, the Scottish Newspaper Society, Humanist Society Scotland, and the Catholic Church, that the draft provisions threaten freedom of expression. They raise issues around the vague language of the provisions, the fact you don't need to prove intent to show a crime has been committed, the low threshold of behaviour or communications being threatening or abusive, with the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents suggesting it may capture people expressing relatively mainstream views. Very quickly, please, Mr. Hart. Patrick Harvey. I thank the member. Will he at least acknowledge that the pro-equality organisations are largely arguing in favour of this provision and that nobody, as far as I'm aware, has argued that the existing stirring up offence in relation to racism should be repealed. So why should we allow this unlevel playing field when the pro-equality organisations are asking for promises to be kept to, to, to consolidate the legislation? Liam Kerr. Yes, I would acknowledge that. Of course I would acknowledge that because there have been all these submissions and my point, Mr Harvey, is very clear that these are all uh, opinions, these are all views which are very carefully thought through that deserve an airing and deserve to be considered. And I, I take you right back to the point that I made at the start, that we are on a very tight legislative programme with a committee uh, that has to produce a report at stage one by late December. Uh, the... Uh, in just one example, so I, I was talking, presiding officer, about part two and the issues that have been raised in summary. But just one example I was looking at earlier for women.scot say, had the bill been law during the period of consultation on reform of the Gender Recognition Act in 2004, many women would have been terrified to voice their concerns under threat of possible prosecution. Now, the Justice Secretary's stated position on this is, 
it will rightly be a matter for our independent courts to determine whether an offence has been committed on the basis of an independent objective assessment of the available evidence. But it is not good enough to say the courts will decide where the threshold for criminality is. Without any case law, there is no basis for judges to take those decisions until, unless and until, people find themselves in court having to prove their innocence. And I think Roddy Dunlop QC is right to question, for example, whether comedians will feel comfortable telling jokes that some may find offensive. Uh, the Sheriff's Association concluded in relation to whether a person's behaviour would have been likely to stir up hatred, it will be exceptionally difficult to direct a jury on these matters. And all of this before we even get to full investigation of the cost. The Justice Secretary I know is well aware that the Scottish Police Federation said the financial memorandum's estimated cost of the bill was grossly underestimated. They also said several policing costs were unaccounted for in the memorandum, including the cost of investigating complaints against officers. Now, all of that, presiding officer, gets us to the final part of my motion and the solution I seek Parliament's support on today. The Justice Secretary states that he wants to create robust laws which will ensure action can be taken against perpetrators and send a strong message that offences motivated by prejudice are not tolerated. But this bill is not robust. It is vague in the extreme. I have a real concern that properly investigating, scrutinising and making these complex changes in the context of 2,000 written submissions is not possible in a crowded parliamentary timetable, further compl uh, complicated by the coronavirus pandemic. This bill has been brought forward with the best of intentions and to address a pernicious and malevolent presence in society. But as drafted, I think it risks undermining these intentions. I desperately want to ensure that the committee has the time to scrutinise this bill properly and the unprecedented response to this bill means time is not on our side. The Murray Blackburn Mackenzie Collective say we've barely begun to work through the evidence and do not know what further points related to part one have been made. And I just fear that part two will suck all the oxygen, oxygen out of that debate and polarise us, leaving the very real, very difficult challenges in other parts of the le legislation stifled. Now, the Faculty of Advocates said that in light of the difficulties that exist with the current text, they, quote, consider that there is no alternative but to reconsider the draft bill. And that is the solution that I propose in my motion, to withdraw this draft bill and immediately begin work with stakeholders and others to draft and bring forward as quickly as possible the legislation that is needed to tackle hate crime in Scotland without threatening freedom of speech. This bill is far too far reaching, too important to risk getting this wrong. Bad legislation is not the way to stop bad behaviour. By pushing ahead with the bill as drafted, the government may lose the chance to achieve an updated and fully modernised approach to legislating for hate as an aggravator, which people on all sides of Parliament could pass with pride and which would command strong public support and the support of those who would be putting the law into practice. For all these reasons, presiding officer, I move this motion in my name. Thank you very much. I remind members that time is not on our side in relation to this afternoon's business uh, and therefore urge members to stick to time as far as possible. I now call on Humza Yusuf to speak to and move Amendment 22636.4. Mr Yusuf, eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the uh, amendment uh, in my name. Uh, can I thank uh, Liam Kerr and the Conservatives for bringing this uh, motion to the Chamber because uh, I think it's always important for us to be talking about how we intend collectively to tackle uh, hate crime. And uh, let me say from the offset, there will be disagreements around the bill, the interpretation of it, uh, what it seeks to do, the unintended possible consequences of it. But let me say right from the offset, I don't doubt for one second the sincerity of every single member here uh, in relation to their uh, desire to tackle hate crime. I, I know members, uh, those that I know well and have dealt with, but even those that I don't know so well, uh, I don't doubt for a minute their sincerity uh, in wanting to tackle hate crime. We have demonstrated time and time in this parliament that we stand united as one uh, against uh, that pernicious uh, crime. Um, can I say, uh, again, from the offset, again, the obvious that the Scottish Government, we will work tirelessly uh, to engage with colleagues right across the Chamber, external stakeholders, uh, and indeed anybody else uh, that wishes to, to, to contribute towards uh, the Hate Crime Bill and uh, looking to debate uh, and, if necessary, amend and improve uh, that bill. What we can't do, and I'm not suggesting uh, anybody is doing this, but what we can't do is be complacent about the, uh, the, the nature of the challenge. More than 5,600 
hate crimes were reported to the uh, Crown Office, uh, almost 7,000 hate crimes reported to Police Scotland. I do emphasise reported because we know, I think in our experience, all of us will know and recognise that not all hate crime is reported uh, to the police often uh, out of fear. And being a victim of hate crime undoubtedly is a dreadful experience uh, for anyone. And let me just again reflect on the fact that it was less than three months ago this Parliament came together uh, to debate the Black Lives Matters movement and came, I think, in solidarity to rededicate ourselves uh, against uh, hatred. So while legislation in, in itself is not enough to build an inclusive and equal society that Scotland aspires to, having hate crime legislation is, uh, in my view, a vital component. Uh, in particular, it makes clear to victims, to perpetrators, communities and to wider society that offences motivated by prejudice, prejudice will not be tolerated. Uh, the need for modernised legislation has only become more apparent as social media continues to permeate our daily lives. The internet has brought with it challenges we did not have in the past by providing a platform for people who wish to share hateful abuse. And can I just say that it isn't just unsettling words, although words, of course, can have uh, an impact. Uh, members will be aware, and it's referenced by Liam Kerr in his opening remarks, I, I of course, have uh, received uh, hateful abuse uh, right throughout my uh, life, but particularly in my political career. Uh, and, and most recently, uh, th these were not just uh, harmful words, these were threats to, to me and my family to firebomb my house, to stab me, to kick me in the face uh, until I bleed, all because of the colour of my skin. So I am afforded protection law from people stirring up hatred against me due to the colour of my skin, due to my race. Should the same protection not be afforded to people due to other protected characteristics? If you are disabled, if you are gay, if you are Jewish, should you not be afforded the same protection in law and have the law recognise an offence of stirring up hatred against you in the same way it protects me? Yes. Of course I'll give way. Yes, uh, give way on that point. Uh, he's absolutely right. And of course these protections should be in place. And uh, I think this parliament respects him as an individual for the way that he has handled many of the horrible things that have happened to him and his family. But at, at the base point of this debate, is about language, about the words that matter in a bill and about the interpretation of that in law. And the concern that this side of the chamber has is that that interpretation is open to so much chance and dispute that the bill as it stands just now, particularly because of part two, is in danger of inciting some of the worst aspects of human behavior. And is it not right that we remove the bill and start again? So let me say to Liz Smith that the racial stirring of offences has existed since 1986, for 34 years. And I can't find in my reading, though I'm happy for anybody to challenge me, a single case where it has been a controversial prosecution of that stirring up offence. And all we're doing is essentially replicating the language, actually not quite replicating the language, we're making the threshold even higher. We're removing the insulting threshold that currently exists, and I can see her shaking her head, but this is what we're doing. And therefore, if that protection has worked for 34 years without much controversy, as far as I can see, but again, I'm happy to be challenged, then why do we think it would suddenly become controversial because it applies to you because you're disabled or because of your sexual orientation and so on and so forth? I don't dispute that we should have time as a parliament to debate this. This bill is three years in the making uh, from when Lord Brackadale uh, began uh, his review. It has had, uh, he, uh, of course, uh, spoke to many stakeholders. We had a government consultation. We had roadshows uh, that went right across the country. I attended uh, a number of them uh, myself. And we now have uh, six months of this parliamentary uh, session, three months until we uh, are due that uh, stage one report from the parliament. I think that is enough time. If we have to work through recess, I put on the record that I will make myself available uh, during the recesses. If it means working on weekends, I will make myself available to work on the weekends. But we should not delay this bill any further because the vital protections it guarantees and affords people in law are not something that can be waited for. And I thought the really powerful contribution today that I read was from Victim Support Scotland, from Kate Wallace, the chief executive, of Victim Support Scotland, where she said very, very clearly that people who are targeted by hate, victims who are targeted by hate, cannot afford to wait another parliamentary term uh, for those protections. I do think that uh, is hugely important. I don't take away, uh, of course I will. Patrick Harvey. 
I'm grateful to the Minister. Uh, as well as uh, victims and potential victims of, of hate crime uh, wanting that clarity, there is a good argument that everybody who might fear that they would be accused of this offence also needs clarity. Does the Minister agree that the stirring up offence, as has been used for more than 30 years, gives clarity, whereas aggravated breach of the peace, which is the only way to prosecute such offences, or the main way to prosecute such offences at the moment, is itself much vaguer than what is in this bill? That's certainly an, an argument to be made uh, uh, to, to that effect. But what I would say uh, to all members is I am not trying or attempting to uh, rush the parliamentary process. I think there's a very good timetable by the Justice Committee, agreed by, 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 by all members. What I would say is that naturally, from all the commentary that I've seen, the stirring up offences are the area which command, uh, oh, certainly, sorry, sorry which, uh, which, which gain the most attention. I think they probably will gain the most scrutiny when it comes to the Justice Committee's own uh, oral evidence. And let me recognise that I don't doubt there are some legitimate concerns. I have to say there has been some incredibly sensational reporting also about them. But if I put that to the side, there are very clearly legitimate concerns that people have in relation to the stirring up offences. So in that regard, I will absolutely listen to the evidence the Justice Committee uh, brings forward. I will also listen to external stakeholders. I am engaging constantly with the stakeholders and I give an absolute assurance on uh, the record and for the record uh, that I will actively look to see where we may be able to find a uh, compromise. But I will just, and I will give away in just a second, uh, and just note that Lord Brackadale says, uh, when it came to the extension of the stunning up offences, that they would not, and I quote from Lord Brackadale, would not, quote unquote, seriously hinder uh, robust debate. And of course, I give way to I, Liam. I, I remind members to come, Secretary, as, and, and indeed beyond his last minute, so please, uh, a very, very brief interview. I shall be brief, presiding officer. It's just simply to say, does the Cabinet Secretary not accept that, actually, he's just made my point for me, that uh, there is a danger that the part two, the stirring up offences, will take all the oxygen and will take all of that scrutiny to the detriment of some very important points elsewhere in the bill. I don't. I think there's enough time for us to, to, to give due attention to the stirring up offences, but also some of the other points that he legitimately raises. I will just end, because I'm, of course, aware of the time, uh, by saying uh, to Lib Dems uh, and to the Greens in particular uh, that I will listen. Uh, I, I thought that amendments and the motions uh, made some very, very valid points. And, and of course, uh, as I've said, I intend to come back to Parliament if I can before the oral evidence sessions take place at the Justice Committee to give further uh, details of how I wish to take the bill forward. And to the Conservatives, I conclude uh, by simply saying, uh, look, we have a, an important job as parliamentarians, as legislators. It's our job to scrutinise the bill, debate it, amend it, and yes, where necessary, improve it. I would hope that they wouldn't attempt to torpedo a, a bill in this parliamentary session. Instead, work with the government. If we have to put extra sessions on, let's do it. But let's ensure that we give a very strong message to those who are the victims and targets of hatred that we will not abandon them, we will not walk away from this bill, and we will look to get a robust piece of legislation that will protect them. Thank you very much. I now call on uh, Loda Grant to speak to and move Amendment 22636.3, uh, seven minutes. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, hate crime has no place in a modern Scotland, and it's simply wrong. No one should be subject to hatred and to subject people to hatred because of their race, their genders or sexuality, disability or indeed some of the other characteristics is wrong. And yet these are some of the things that people choose to single out others for and subject them to hatred because of it. It's absolutely senseless. Sadly, hatred seems to be totally unleashed by social media and indeed the Cabinet Secretary made that point in his own remarks. It's always been there, but there's never been a platform that give the haters so much protection and allow them to spread their bile unchallenged. As a woman, I know what hatred looks like. Most women have been subject to misogyny, to be disregarded, ignored, demeaned and hated just because you're a woman. And because of this, violence against women is endemic. I welcome the proposals for separate offence of misogyny has been accepted, but why do women have to wait so long for this? Brackadale published his review over two years ago, and we're only getting to legislation now. The Scottish Government are only setting up a working group to look at misogyny. It's taking far too long. Being a woman being subject to misogyny does not lead me to hate or even resent other groups who face similar abuse. It makes me want to make common cause 
to work with them to stand up against hate crime. And that is what we in this parliament should be doing. We should be trying to build consensus against hatred and promoting tolerance. And I believe we all welcomed the Bracadale Review and wanted to tackle hate crime in our society. However, we can't breed tolerance without knowledge and without debate, and freedom of speech must therefore be protected. How else can we debate issues that see each other's viewpoint? That's how we find common ground. That's what we do. Um, but we must do it without hatred. And inciting someone to hatred is something that is altogether different than debate. We all recognise incitement to hatred when we see it. We don't want debate shut down simply because who shouts loudest um, can, can create the greater understanding and, and close off other people's position. Those of us who are subject to hatred have a duty to come together and fight it. And that's why the legislation's welcome. However, as it stands, it's not fit for purpose. It will pitch the very people it sets out to protect against each other. Section two of the bill is where the greatest concern lies. The language, the terminology, strays into covering behavior and material that is merely insulting. Contrary to the Brackdale Review, and contrary to what is the case elsewhere in the UK. It will catch much more um, than hate crime and will breed intolerance and resentment, the opposite of what it is aiming to achieve. The government and parliament have a duty when forming new laws and criminal offences to ensure that the law is clear, fair, and that it is not open to abuse or manipulation. Serious concerns have also been raised about the threshold for criminal liability namely the lack of intent required for criminalising behaviour or material. And Lord Brackdale's review recommended extending the likelihood test to stirring up offences related to protected groups other than race. Is that On that point, yeah. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. Uh, I mean, would you accept that, firstly, intent is extremely difficult to prove? And secondly, there are alternative wording, I think, from the Law Society, for example, significant risk. So there is room to improve the wording. Rhoda Grant. Um, I, I welcome John Mason's intervention and I hope that that is a sign that the backbenchers in the government's party are looking to amend this legislation and change it. Um, Lord Brackadale, as I was saying, um, stated that stirring up hatred is conduct which encourages others to hate a particular group. The intention of the perpetrator is that hatred of the group as a whole is aroused in other persons. Hate is pri primarily relevant, not as a motive for the crime, but as a possible effect of the perpetrator's conduct. The need for intent is as an important principle in criminal law and not one that can easily be cast aside, especially in such serious matters as these. In England and Wales, there must be intention to stir up hatred and offences relating to religious, religion or and sexual orientation. Under the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010, the general offence of threatening and abusive behaviour requires both that reason, a reasonable person would suffer fear or alarm, and the person must intend the behaviour to cause this fear and alarm or be reckless as to whether it would. Under the current drafting of the bill, Section 2 does include a general defence of reasonableness. However, contrary to specific defences previously provided for the Public Order Act 1986, the bill has only a general defence of reasonableness, which is much more wide-ranging and open to interpretation. Section 2 also contains provisions providing for the protection of freedom of expression with regard to religion and sexual orientation, although some have pointed out that needing to reference that protection says more about the potential impact of the bill than offers reassurance. Where the door is left open is to use the law to stymie debate when the law will not protect those who it is meant to. We need not just a law on hate crime, we need a good law on hate crime. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment today that he will work with others because I don't believe the Scottish Government can dig their heels in. They have to listen to concerns and they need to act on them. 
The checks and balances in this parliament must be used to their full to scrutinise this legislation and make sure it works for all Scots. It will be unacceptable for the government simply to use their committee members to nod through legislation, and it does us all a disservice. Government backbenchers have a job to do, and they have to get it right. And their job is to defend defective drafting, is not to defend defective drafting, it is to defend the national interest. They must listen to the concerns expressed and find out ways of making this legislation work. If they cannot do this, then we will withdraw our support. If it proceeds, there are two further occasions when the Parliament can vote it down. And I need to be clear that it would be our duty to do that if the legislation was defective. Thank, thank you very much. Can I just check, Ms Grant, if you have moved the amendment, please? Move the amendment. Thank you very much. And can I now call on John Finney to speak to and move amendment 22636.2. Mr Finney, six minutes. Uh, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. Can I start by moving the amendment in my name, please, and, and talk about the specifics that are contained therein. We talk about the development of hate crime law and the piecemeal nature um, of that, and it's resulted in fragmented legislation. And there's been hate calls for consolidation for more than a decade, and uh, I, I think that that's a simple matter of fact, and the principle of consolidation seems to be widely welcomed and has benefits, as we've seen with sexual offences. The motion also uh, believes that freedom of expression is a critically important human right. It is absolutely fundamental. But, of course, it's not an unqualified right. Article 10 of the European, European Convention on Human Rights protects it within the context of factors such as the prevention of crime and protecting the rights of others. And recognising that stirring up racial hatred has been the basis of criminal offences since 1986. Now, we've heard that a couple of times now. And what we do know, and is reiterated in our uh, amendment, that's clearly compatible with ECHR. Now, if I can refer members to the SPICE briefing, it talks about Lord Backdale concludes that, and I quote here, extending the stirring up offences in Scotland would not infringe the Article 10 right to freedom of expression. That's paragraph 528 of his reports. Um, turning to misogynistic harassment, uh, we welcome... Yes, indeed. Liam Kerr. Just, I think this is a really important point. I mean, yes, I hear what he says about Lord Brackadale, um, but in the implementation, does he not accept that there is a danger that they, there could be an infringement uh, on human rights? And if there is, isn't the practical impact of that that you end up with a bill that doesn't work? So we should take a step back. John Finney. Yes, um, I, I'm grateful for the member for the intervention. And I do come on to that, and I'm going to cover the competing arguments around that particular issue, uh, Mr Kerr. Yeah. Um, on misogynistic harassment, that's unfinished work as far as we are concerned. Toxic masculinity must be addressed, and we look forward to that being prog uh, progressing. We commit to listening to all serious views and ways to improve it. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do that as part of the normal parliamentary process of scrutiny. And uh, um, we also go on to consider how best to ensure that all forms of hate crime are taken seriously. Now, I'm with the Cabinet Secretary on this. I don't think any members in here aren't behind the thrust of wanting to address this pernicious aspect. Um, what we know, the bill seeks to modernise, and we welcome an update and improvement in the definition of transgender uh, identity um, in Section 14. Uh, yes, the issue of sex came up, uh, and, and that is important. Lord Brackadale had proposed that. And, and the issue of age is another issue that we'll come to. Um, so consolidation and also extending. And the sections three and five of the bill stirring up um, hatred and uh, possessing inflammatory material. The existing offences, sections 18 to 23 of the Public Order Act, apply to race only. Now, is it the view of those who don't support it uh, that it should not be extended to religion, where Jewish faith groups and interfaith Scotland support the bill. It should not be extended to disability. And Inclusion Scotland tell us there are a million disabled people in Scotland today, and there's a steady increase in the number of reported hate crimes against disabled people in Scotland in recent years. That it should not extend to sexual orientation, transgender identity, and variations in sex characteristics when the Equality Network tell us hate crime is part of the wider societal issue of marginalisation. And it's good to see the Scottish Government recognise that Tackling this problem needs both legislative and non-legislative solutions. An important aspect is the strengthening the protection of people because of their association with others. That could be the partner of a disabled person, and we all know from our casework of, of issues like that. Um, 
the court, the court has an important role in stating the offences, recording the offences and taking the aggravation into account. And I think that will help statistically. It's a minor detail, but it is alluded to in some of the... Now, coming to Mr Kerr's point, uh, Spice Briefing tell us, and I quote here, the bill includes specific provisions seeking to protect freedom of expression in relation to religion and sexual conduct and practices. Police Scotland tell us the inclusion of a freedom of speech provision is to be welcomed. The absence of such a clause could result in Police Scotland being burdened with vexatious reports of crimes. Faculty of Advocates take a, a slightly different approach and they say, and I quote from their briefing, and I'm grateful to all the organisations providing briefings, the Scottish Government acknowledges the existence of concern around the impact of Article 10, um, which guarantees freedom of expression. The faculty has reservations about the position of the Scottish Government that the proposed sections 11 and 10 meet these concerns. They go on to say what we know it is accordingly for the government to justify any interference with freedom of expression under the article. And very helpfully, very helpfully, and someone with Mr Kerr's legal background will appreciate this, the point is in the direction of guidance set out by uh, Lord Roger, um, this is at paragraph 25, when they talk about is it clear Article 10 is engaged? If so, what is the basis for interference with Article 10 to? What is the legitimate aim being pursued in restricting freedom of expression? Does that pass the test of necessity? Is the restriction proportionate to achieving the legitimate aims? Now, these are not the, sing the, the sole concerns that they have. There's others. And where is the locus for, <laughs> for airing, scrutinising, interrogating, as I think Mr Kerr, the terms used, in a unicameral setup by Towers, it is this, the committee. And I have every confidence, every confidence that the Justice Committee uh, will, will look at this. We know that uh, my past experience is that deficiencies in legislation have always been highlighted in a stage one report. They've always been responded to. And if the government doesn't amend, then I can assure you, I and I suspect Mr Kerr would as well. We know the competing interests that appear, that appear in the legislation in front of us. We've got that with the defamation at the moment, where it is about increased freedom of speech against the legal profession wanting to retain uh, the, um, uh, the uh, position of people whose reputations may be damned. I have every confidence in that our system of parliamentary scrutiny and I hope Mr Kerr eventually will too. Thank you. Thank you very much and I now call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move amendment 22636.1. Six minutes Mr MacArthur. Thank you Deputy President Officer. I too welcome today's debate on the government's hate crime bill. Uh, I thank Liam Kerr uh, for allowing it to happen though I do regret uh, the last-minute decision by the, the Tories to move to a position that is more intemperate and, I believe, wrong. Hopefully, however, the amendments to the motion reveal a growing acceptance that this bill needs urgent and, in places, radical surgery. Deputy Presiding Officer, when we see debate in the political and social sphere being dragged to the extremes, when we consider the extent to which social media and the internet empower individuals and groups to reach ever wider audiences with whatever hateful views they may hold, and as we reflect on the fact that all forms of hate crime appear to be on the increase, I think it's fair to conclude that now is not a bad time uh, to be checking whether or not our laws in this area are fit for purpose, not least in protecting the rights and the freedoms we hold to be most important. As Bemis pointed out, Scotland is not immune to racism or prejudice. Here, though, we as legislators must tread with care. After all, without freedom of speech, what philosopher John Milton described as the liberty to know, to utter and to argue freely according to conscience, our other fundamental freedoms are devalued and diminished. Of course, freedom of speech is not and should not be an unfettered right. Indeed, it would be irresponsible to act as if it were. And so here, as with so much else we do in this Parliament, balances must be struck. But as a Liberal, I was rather taken by the quote from Lord Justice Sedley, uh, referred to in the Law Society's briefing uh, submission to the Justice Committee on the Hate Crime Bill. He argued that free speech includes not only the inoffensive, but the irritating, the contentious, the eccentric, the heretical, the unwelcome uh, and the provocative. Yeah, yeah. Freedom only to speak inoffensively is not worth having. Yeah. However committed I am to measures that robustly confront and tackle hate crime, and I most certainly am. I agree with Lord Justice Sedley. So I don't take issue with the need to update the law in relation to hate crime, nor the Scottish Government's motivation in looking to do so. This process, 
Um, yes, certainly. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. And I, I agree with the, 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 the sentiment he's expressing, but would he also accept that freedom of speech does not include the protection of threatening or abusive behaviour, which this bill is explicitly aimed at? And the Article 10 uh, of ECHR very clearly says that freedom of expression comes with duties and responsibilities. Liam McCarthy. I, I'm grateful to Patrick Harvey. I think that is, that is fair comment. I think though, the, the concerns that we have seen expressed in relation to the way that part two uh, of this bill engages with those freedoms are ones that we need to take seriously. And to the point about the uh, timetable that I'll come on to in a second, is that we cannot afford to be taking the sorts of moves that are going to be required to deal with part two through the stage two process. And I think I welcome what I thought I heard the Cabinet Secretary say in terms of uh, coming forward with proposals ahead of us taking evidence that stage one so that we can test those proposals as part of our scrutiny in stage one. Um, the process though uh, has exposed the difficulties and the risks despite the best efforts of Lord Brackadale in laying the foundations for the legislation we want to see. Unfortunately what has emerged since uh, Lord Brackadale produced his uh, report has not done justice to his efforts or I believe the collective effort uh, uh, desire within and out with this parliament to see our uh, laws updated in such a way as to provide legitimate and proportionate protections against the worst examples of hate crime. Anything that manages to unite in common cause the Humanist Society, Catholic Church, Police Scotland, as well as the great and the good of our arts and cultural community boasts impressive powers of cohesion. Uh, but that is a claim that uh, the Justice Secretary can uh, now boast. Indeed, the response to the Justice Committee's call for evidence, some 2,000 submissions, lays bare the extent of the concerns felt by an impressively wide cross-section of stakeholders, many of whom made the same points when responding to the government's earlier consultation. The criticisms, though, are largely focused on the impact part two of this bill would have on freedom of expression. Few, if any, back the Tories called for this bill to be ditched entirely. In fact, I'm not sure that that's a position backed by all those in the Tory benches we will hear from later on this afternoon. So how has the government managed to antagonise so many so profoundly? Essentially, by presenting to Parliament a bill that combines too much vagueness with mission creed. I'm bound to say it bears uncomfortable echoes with what we saw at times with the now repealed Defensive Behaviour Football Act where the government blundered into a complex area of law with an apparent lack of either care or understanding about the pitfalls and consequences. The intentions here are undoubtedly more laudable, but the outcome could potentially be even worse. The Law Society has expressed alarm at the creation of unduly wide new offences, which will restrict freedom of expression and lack clarity or policy justification. Scottish Pen warns of a substantial expansion in the criminal law. Meanwhile, the Scottish Police Federation, no thank you, Scottish Police Federation has deep misgivings at the prospect of officers being left to police speech. Introducing stirring up offences without any requirement to prove intent, unlike similar laws elsewhere in the UK, risks creating a catch-all offence with the potential genuinely to catch all. Mm. Little wonder that artists, authors and journalists are so dismayed and warn that the bill risks stifling freedom of expression. They argue that the right to critique ideas must be protected to allow an artistic and democratic society to, to uh, flourish. This is a theme repeated by the Scottish Newspaper Society and indeed the Humanist Society. The Justice Secretary insists, and I believe him, that he hears the concerns, but he must do more than that. I think, as uh, he's nodding at the moment, I heard him uh, commit earlier on to come back to the Justice Committee before it begins at stage one uh, oral evidence to set out proposals um, uh, in response because we need those proposals so that the committee can take evidence from witnesses, witnesses that have made plain what they believe needs to change and who expect changes to be made. Yes, the government could come forward with amendments at stage two, but by then it will be too late to take the detailed evidence we need. This matters too much to be shoehorned into a process that is already tight for time. In the absence of substantive changes to uh, part two coming forward in the coming weeks, this is not a bill that Scottish Liberal Democrats can support. Unlike the Tories, however, I believe these changes are possible. I believe there are ways of providing more clarity of language and purpose while removing the elements in part two that pose unnecessary risks. At the same time, this can help preserve those elements of the bill that are welcome and deserve to be passed into law. In the words of one commentator, Deputy Presiding Officer, recently, 
In an attempt to make uh, bad people nicer, we should not risk making good people criminals. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate, and I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate addressing the Conservative motion. Uh, the motion makes it clear um, that the Conservatives believe hate crime should not be tolerated in a modern, inclusive nation such as Scotland. And I think that's agreed across this chamber. The motion proposes working with stakeholders and organisations to draft alternative legislation. And I'm puzzled as to why that should be the route that we take here. Why can an immediate start not be made working with the government to amend the existing draft bill? This bill should be no different to any other. It should be and will be subjected to rigorous scrutiny and amended if there are concerns. And I think in some ways today's debate is a start on that. I hope this debate can be carried out in a respectful, meaningful way as we try to resolve some of the issues causing concern that we've heard already today. But we can only do that by working together, as the Cabinet Secretary has suggested, not by instigating sweeping measures to scrap the bill entirely, as the Conservative motion calls for. Presiding officer figures show that the number of hate crimes has been rising, and we know that doing nothing cannot be an option in a modern, civilised nation such as Scotland. The new bill will bring Scotland's hate crime legislation into one statute, making the law easier to understand and more user-friendly, and will implement, implement the findings of an extensive independent review on hate crime carried out by Lord Brackadale two years ago. Presiding officer, the last part of the Conservative motion asserts that the bill would make free speech a crime, and I, I, I genuinely do not believe that's the case. We will always be free to disagree. The bill does not seek to stifle rigorous debate or criticism or inhibit freedom of expression, which is a human right. An insult in this bill does not constitute a hate crime. Liam MacArthur's amendment calls on the government to set out the plans to address concerns in free speech, which the Cabinet Secretary, I understand, has agreed to do. And there is concern we've heard today already about the, the definition of stirring up hatred. But the facts are that a court will decide whether you have behaved in a threatening or abusive manner, and that needs to be proved beyond reasonable doubt in court. If, the, if that definition needs improved, then I'm sure that will be one area that's focused on. And there's also a defence that you're caught. Yes. Liam Kerr. Just on that point, I mean, presumably then, does the member not see that there is an issue that if uh, she was a comedian or an actor or some such, would she not have a concern that the words that she may be uh, speaking may result in her ending up in court having to defend herself in a court environment against issues uh, that we're looking at today? Rona Mackay. I think the point is that that, that, uh, that would be taken in context. The whole point of you know, stirring up hatred and a court would take that in context. And comedians should, should not be inhibited in what they say and what they, what they do. It's, been, it's always been, been the way. So, I mean, this, is, this bill would not, um, would not mean that. Um, so, so it's, and there's an extremely high bar before conduct is criminalised. Um, John Finney's amendment states that stirring up racial hatred has been the basis of criminal offences since 1986 and is clearly compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, as he's uh, articulated. Um, and this bill simply highlights that expressions of hate against religion, age, disability, race, religion, sexual orientation, trans transgender identity and variations in sex characteristics are simply, simply not part of a tolerant society. Um, let me quote some experts of, of some various stakeholders. The Equality Network says, we agree with those who say it's important that those offences do not impinge on legitimate free speech. The existing stirring up of hate, racial hatred offence has not done that, and neither have in England and we, uh, Wales the offences there of stirring up hatred on grounds of religion or sexual orientation. The Equality and Human Rights Commission Scotland say we welcome the bill and Scottish Government's aim of ensuring Scotland's hate crime legislation is fit for the 21st century. Um, I, there, are, there are many more endorsements which I, I frankly don't have time to go through. I've just, just uh, looked at the clock. Um, so finally, presiding officer, I'm extremely pleased that the principle of standalone offence and misogynistic harassment will be developed and that is widely supported by women's and equality groups. 
a working group will be established to take this forward and consider how the criminal justice system deals with misogyny, including whether there are gaps in the law that could be filled with a specific offence or misogynistic harassment. So in conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland is a place where there must be zero tolerance of hate crime. I think we all agree that. This bill, after consultation and negotiation, will aim to strike the right balance between respecting freedom of speech and tackling the scourge of hate speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, right now, while we are meeting in this chamber, in a courtroom in Paris, 14 people are on trial over the deadly attack on the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. In January 2015, the world was shocked when 12 people were uh, brutally shot dead in and around Charlie Hebdo's Paris office. The attack followed the publication by the magazine of satirical cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad that caused great offence in the Muslim world. And following that horrific attack, there was an outbreak of mass solidarity, with millions of people across the world taking part in support marches. They and we were proud to display the slogan, Je suis Charlie, in defence of the principle of free speech. And the French President Emmanuel Macron has been absolutely clear in his defence of freedom of the press and indeed the freedom to blaspheme, which is linked to the freedom of conscience. And these incidents are relevant to us today in our consideration of the Scottish Government's hate crime bill. And I should say at the outset that I believe there is much in the bill that is worthy of support. I have written for years about why I believe blasphemy law in Scotland, a law which has fallen into disuse, having last been prosecuted in Scotland in 1843, should be abolished. As a churchgoer, it has always seemed to me bizarre that the power of the Christian message would require man-made laws to protect or defend it. But there is a huge concern that part two of the bill before us would effectively try to reintroduce a blasphemy law under a different guise. What that provision in the bill states is that it will be a criminal offence to stir up hatred against a protected group, being any group defined by reference to race, age, disability, religion, sexual orientation, transgender identity, and variations in sex characteristics. And crucially, for any prosecution to succeed, it would not be necessary to prove that there was an intent on the part of an accused person to stir up hatred, rather that, having regard to all the circumstances, hatred in relation to a particular characteristic is likely to be stirred up thereby. And it, not at the moment. Uh, and it is there that the real problem arises. And, presiding officer, I believe that the Charlie Hebdo case is very relevant to this new law. The Charlie Hebdo magazine produced a series of satirical cartoons, not just offensive to those of the Muslim faith, but also depictions of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost that were crude, appalling and likely to cause outrage amongst Christians. It is entirely conceivable, and this point has been made by many commentators, that if the Charlie Hebdo magazine were to be published in Scotland, once this law came into force, it could face prosecution and undoubtedly would face police inquiry for stirring up hatred against a protected group, namely the followers of a particular religion. Indeed, not just now. Indeed, under Section 5, Subsection 2 of the Bill, it is an offence simply to be in possession of inflammatory material. So having in one's home a copy of an offensive publication could lead to prosecution. So, presiding officer, it would be a rich irony indeed if just five years on from us marching in solidarity with the Charlie Hebdo victims, with us proudly proclaiming Je suis Charlie, we now introduced a law here that could see prosecution for publication of the same material. Yes, I'll give way. I, I thank the member. I'm listening very carefully to what Wendell Fraser has to say. I just wonder, why does he think that the racial stirring up offence, which again has largely the same thresholds, in some argument a lower threshold because it includes the insulting threshold, why do you think in 34 years that hasn't caused you know, mass uh, jailing of, 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 of journalists or comedians, but he thinks that extending that protection to other protected characteristics would do that? Well, the Cabinet Secretary will know that there is a debate around issues. For example, the gender debate. There's likely to provoke responses that you do not see in a debate around racial issues. And that, I think, to me, is the difference. And there is a, a fundamental issue here of free speech. Because in any open, liberal and democratic society, citizens should have the right to discuss, criticise and refute ideas, beliefs and practices in robust terms. 
Some of that may lead to individuals being offended, but there should not be in law any right not to be offended. I have grave concerns about what is now termed the cancel culture, the attempt to close down debate, to silence those whose views are deemed unacceptable. So, no, thank you. We see feminists like Germaine Greer and J.K. Rowling becoming victims of the mob who are not prepared to permit debate, even when what they are saying is simply a biological fact on the question of gender. Free speech is important, and not least because society will only advance if it can openly discuss ideas. The ideas we hold today in society on a whole range of issues, human rights, the rights of women, uh, the issue of human sexuality, on the welfare of animals, and a host of other topics, would be regarded as outlandish, if not offensive, to those who lived 100 years ago. But societal change only came about because people were prepared to champion and openly debate and discuss what were at first heresies and ideas that caused offence at the time. George Orwell famously wrote, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. The freedom to hear only opinions with which we agree is no freedom at all. As parliamentarians, as policymakers, as leaders of public opinion, we must be prepared to defend the right to express unpopular opinions, whether we personally agree with them or not. Deputy Presiding Officer Jim Sillers, formerly the Deputy Leader of the SNP, has said this, freedom of thought articulated by one's speech is so fundamental to the civic and intellectual life of our nation that any attempt by the government to restrict that freedom has to be robustly opposed. He is right, and the whole host of other voices, academics, writers, comedians, faith groups, and human rights campaigners agree with him. Presiding officer, for all these reasons, the Scottish Government needs to think again when it comes to this bill. If Je Sweet Charlie meant anything more than empty words, we should support the motion in Liam Kerr's name. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Fulton McGregor and to be followed by Mary Fee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, and I'm sure I can start um, uh, my speech today by saying that we can all agree that Scotland in the 21st century has no room for prejudice, hatred, discrimination and bigotry. But a bit like my colleague uh, Ronan Mackay, I'm a wee bit puzzled by the, 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 the Tory um, motion today because I think that it comes at it from the wrong angle. Uh, and, and you can't help but think, and I know that individuals in the Tory benches are very much committed to tackling prejudice, but when you see a motion like this wanting to basically uh, take the bill out, which no other party is recommending, it does question that. So I, 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 I can't say that I'm not puzzled there. Yes, there are some concerns with the bill. I think we can all acknowledge that. And that's why we've got due parliamentary process. And as a member of the Justice Committee will be looking at this bill, I'm looking forward to hearing and scrutinising the evidence that will come before us. And I can ensure constituents that have been in touch uh, with me, as well as colleagues across the chamber, that I'll work to make changes to this legislation where there are concerns and help to deliver legislation that the whole Parliament can have faith in. Legislation that is strong and helps prevent members of our society being, from being subjected to hate based on their race, disability, gender, religion or sexual orientation. It is clear that the creation of a new stirring up hatred crime is proving the most controversial aspect. Uh, and I would also like to thank all those who have made submissions to the committee uh, that we have heard about. Me meeting with stakeholders through stage one will allow us to better understand these concerns and seek common ground. But others, as others have already said, long-standing setting up racial hatred offences have operated eff effectively in Scotland since the mid-1980s, and England and Wales have equivalent laws um, for setting up hatred offences as well. Um, this bill, I do not believe, is an attack on free speech. Um, it is still acceptable, as we have heard, to express controversial, challenging or even offensive views as long as it is not done in a threatening or abusive way that is intended or likely to stir up hatred. There is a high bar before conduct is criminalised. But I think, as um, Patrick Harvey uh, mentioned, with free speech comes responsibility. And in order to protect our right to free speech, we must also allow specific laws to ensure this powerful right is used responsibly. So we should not seek any of us um, to politicise this and instead come together as a parliament and make legislation workable and as good as it can be. And I think well, it, it, most, most speakers have already uh, said that today. 
Uh, I can't begin to imagine the physical and mental distress victims of hate crime have to go through, many on a regular basis, uh, and powerful um, testament from the Cabinet Secretary himself in his opening remarks. We must show that crimes motivated by hatred will not be endured in our modern Scotland, and, but sadly research does show that hate crime is on the rise, particularly racial crime. Behaviour like this is not the norm and should never be accepted as so. This bill sends a clear message to society that hate will not be tolerated by updating our existing laws and ensuring they are made more cohesive by combining them into one bill. Surely, whatever deficiencies may be in the bill, we can all agree on this across the chamber. And also, while it's important to consider the submissions raising concerns about the bill, and of course we'll need to take that into account, and there were, there were a lot of submissions, um, and, and well done to the, the Justice Clerks for bringing them together, we must also be mindful that the bill is supported by a large number of stakeholders, many of whom support vulnerable groups day in, day out, including the Equality and Human Rights Commission, YouthLink, Age Scotland, to name but a few. And in a bit more detail, the Equality Network, for example, have welcomed the bill and noted that they do not believe it infringes on free speech and the existing stirring up of racial hatred offences have not done that. And also Victim Support Scotland, who make the important point that the bill now makes hate crime and its impact visible and it forms part of a zero tolerance approach. And I, and I just, um, while well, I'm speaking, President Officer, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish Victim Support Scotland a happy 35th birthday recently and thank those who signed my motion to the Parliament Chamber, which reflected that the organisation was born in Coatbridge in my constituency. And finally, many of the racial equality organisations, Bemis, who have already men been mentioned, say that killing the bill would be a retrograde step, but they do raise concerns. And Crayer, who state that the bill will send a clear message regarding what society finds as intolerable attitudes and beliefs, provide consistency across the legislation. These are the organisations, presiding officer, who are working day in, day out to tackle prejudice. And we should also listen to what they say. And that's what the parliamentary process will allow us to do. So in conclusion, presiding officer, the Conservative motion does not seem to be in line with what everyone else in this, this chamber is saying today. Is the bill perfect? No, we all agree on that. The Cabinet Secretary has said as much. And I give my guarantee to colleagues and constituents that I'll work to improve it. And let's just hope, if their motion is defeated tonight, the Tories will respect that and will do all they can to improve it in Parliament as well and not spend the parliamentary process trying to wreck and undermine the bill. Thank you. Can I just make everyone aware that we are way behind time this afternoon? Um, so if people could be as brief as possible, that would be useful for all of us. Mary Fee, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you. Thank you, pres presiding officer. Let me be clear from the outset that hate crime must be tackled and that I, along with my Scottish Labour colleagues, are supportive of the overall principles that are contained in the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill. Minority and protected groups have been facing growing attacks year on year, and it is right that we say loudly and clearly today that an attack based on someone's race, their religion, their sexuality, their disability, or their gender identity is unacceptable and abhorrent. It's an important step in tackling hate crime that we consolidate hate crime legislation into one single act of Parliament. However, as it stands, this bill is far from ready for enactment of this Parliament. With that in mind, I must say that the proposition of the Scottish Conservatives to scrap the bill is, in my view, unwarranted, and it is up to this Parliament to amend and to improve the legislation. The Scottish Conservatives must engage properly with the parliamentary pro procedures to amend and to scrutinise this draft bill. And, presiding officer, to amend this bill, the Scottish Government must listen and work with stakeholders who share the concerns of many regarding part two of this bill. And as with any legislation of this scope, there must be balance, and in this instance, very careful balance in safeguarding protected groups from hatred, from abuse, and from discrimination, 
but also safeguarding the right to freedom of speech. And sadly, this bill, as it is currently drafted, is unbalanced. However, it should not be confined to the bin just yet. And, presiding officer, I understand the support the bill has received from organisations such as BEMIS, Victim Support Scotland, Stonewall Scotland, and the Equality Network. And I want to see a modern, effective, and single piece of legislation that protects people from hatred. And modernising of the language of protected groups and the addition of age as a characteristic are welcome. And I support these additions as I do the overall principles of the bill. And I support these changes as do a variety of the equality organisations. Yet these changes are not what this debate today is about. Negatively impacting the right to free speech is a line no democratic, dem democratic government should cross. Part two of this bill appears to create more problems than it tries to solve. And critics are vast and wide ranging, and they must be listened to. Academics, the Scottish Police Federation, and the Law Society of Scotland are just some of the voices highlighting the problems with this section of the bill. And the bill also unites religious, humanist, and secular groups in opposition. There are many groups and individuals who I share concerns with. However, there are also a small minority of views that I cannot agree with. I do not believe this bill to be sinister or illegal, as some have suggested. It is simply open to misinterpretation. And, presiding officer, no bill going through this parliament should be open to misinterpretation. We have already seen that with the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, and I do not want to see a repeat of this, as I fear we may be seeing. The Scottish Police Federation has warned that the bill would force officers to police what people think or feel. We must not place police officers in a similar situation when they found themselves routinely criticised for enforcing the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. And in closing, can I repeat Scottish Labour's call that the Parliament must use its procedures to effectively scrutinise and amend this bill. Our amendment is justified and it is considered. And finally, in my time as a, an MSP for West Scotland and indeed throughout my working life, I have stood up and campaigned for equality and social justice. And if this bill progresses, and as my time in this Parliament comes to an end, I want to ensure that one of my last votes will be to enact legislation that effectively protects people from hatred based on who they are or what they believe and does not impede legitimate freedom of speech. Thank you. Call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Liz Smith. Presiding officer, while doing everything we can to ensure Scotland's a place where there's zero tolerance of hate crime, we have to ensure that we strike the right balance between respecting, protecting and upholding all rights, including free speech. Not an easy or simple task, but this bill provides the opportunity to do that by consolidating, modernising and extending hate crime in Scotland. With complex problems, with contentious issues and challenges, it's helpful to start with principles, with areas of agreement. I don't think that anyone in this chamber disagrees that hate crime is a blight on our society that requires a criminal justice response. Crimes driven by hatred and prejudice have deep social consequences, with not just the physical and psychological damage to the victim of the crime, but also to the group the victim belongs to and to our wider community as a whole. For example, where disabled people don't feel they can go out at all or avoid places like town centres, leisure facilities or public transport, it seriously impacts on both their physical and mental health and well-being, and in turn, our wider community, as their talents and contributions are missed. I also agree freedom of expression is a cornerstone of democracy. We should not be complacent about its protection. Freedom of expression is protected by Article 10, and as John Finney said, this freedom carries with it duties and responsibilities and can legitimately be subject to conditions, restrictions or penalties in the interest of, amongst other things, 
public safety and the prevention of disorder or crime. Presiding officer, a number of my constituents have raised concern about freedom of expression, particularly in relation to their faith. Um, I understand their anxiety when there are those who consider themselves to be progressive and inclusive, yet appear entirely intolerant to those with differing faith and beliefs to themselves. I have to say that at the moment, in regard to stirring up, I agree with the Humanist Society of Scotland when they say, charges under the bill on stirring up as is currently drafted would not take into consideration intention. Consequently, this could unintentionally criminalise behaviour that should be protected under the right to free expression. This could seriously hinder important discourse about emotive subjects like religion, race and sexual identity in Scotland, halting progress and stifling free expression. To progress as a country, we have to have that discourse. At the moment, we have a situation where women campaigning to uphold their sex-based rights are routinely accused of hate, of their words being violence. As this bill progresses, they will require reassurance that their right to organise, gather, speak and campaign will not be criminalised. Sex-based hate is excluded from this bill. I appreciate the complexity and differing views around how best to approach misogyny from a criminal justice perspective. And I do welcome the Scottish Government's commitment in principle to develop a standalone offence of misogynistic harassment. Um, I think it would be reassuring for women if the Cabinet Secretary could say in closing uh, when the group will begin work and who will be on it. How long will um, female victims need to wait for that? Human... Yes. Liam Kerr. I can actually assist um, because I asked that very question uh, just recently. The Cabinet Secretary answered on the 27th of August uh, by saying the priority for the Scottish Government at this stage is to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, the work to establish the working group is currently paused. Now, given that, doesn't that rather make my case that uh, th there are very important issues that are being postponed here that we actually need to get right back now to make sure we deal with here and now? Ruth McGuire. I thank Liam Kerr for that intervention. I'll come to that in a bit, but in short, no, I don't think it does uh, make your case. Um, human rights are not a hierarchy. Um, they can and they do come into conflict. It does no one, let alone those at risk or vulnerable, any favours to try and pretend otherwise. Uh, when and where that happens, we as parliamentarians have a duty to do the work, the difficult and sometimes uncomfortable work, to ensure that we have legislation that protects our citizens, all of our citizens, and upholds rights. Our parliamentary process is the place for that to happen. I don't accept that the large, um, huge level of responses to the Justice Committee consultation are a sign that we should abandon that work. I think to do that would be a dereliction of duty. Quite the opposite. The volume of interest and engagement is an indication of the importance of this bill, the importance of cross-party committee working and the bill process. All members of all parties need to put their shoulder to the wheel and do the work that we are sent by our com communities here to do. Presiding officer. Thank you. Liz Smith to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, last year, when this Parliament marked its 20th anniversary, several political commentators uh, focused upon how well they felt that this Parliament had functioned in its short life. It was generally, but by no means universally, a good report. But I remember one particularly interesting debate between journalists and academics about whether the institution had delivered good law. Good law is, of course, the concept in jurisprudence which decrees that a legal decision is both valid and able to hold legal weight, not a law that has to be overturned or rendered obsolete. Good law is one that is very much at the base of good policy making, and as such, it requires these fundamental principles, a clarity of purpose, to be understood in simple language, to be strong in its evidence base, to be workable, and of course, to be accepted by the public. In short, it should be the balance for requirement of simplicity with legal precision. And these are surely the criteria by which we should be judging the hate crime bill before us. And I want to take Parliament's mind back to 2013, if I may, when the Children and Young People's Bill was presented to Parliament. A bill that was generally popular because it was doing so many good things, whether that was about kinship care, about improving children's services, about the presumption uh, against the closure of rural schools.
But it had, at its core, one central principle about getting it right for every child. And that was a concept which no parliamentarian or no right-minding thinking uh, member of the public could possibly disagree. But that bill, which then became an act, had one central problem, and it was about the named person policy. And whatever you think of the named person policy, whether it was right or wrong, the real problem was that it wasn't workable. The stakeholders at the time told us very forcibly back in 2014 that it wasn't going to be workable. Whether that was teachers, whether it was um, people in the health service, whether that was the law society, the advocates, they all told us that it wasn't going to work. We went through with that legislation and after six years, six whole years, at the great expense of civil service time, taxpayers' money, it was proven that it was not workable. In fact, it had to be struck down, not just by uh, the people who had said that it wouldn't be workable, but because of one legal principle that was ruled by the Supreme Court to be against ECHR Article 8. Now, that was a very specific point made by the Supreme Court, who had otherwise said that the proposal to have a named person was actually benign. But it turned out not to be workable. And so, I won't if you don't mind, may I just draw uh, our attention to some of the um, comparisons between this and the hate crime bill that's before us. The hate crime bill will not do what it says on the tin. But despite all the good intentions, part two of the hate crime bill is illiberal, it is intrusive, and it's deeply flawed. And it's not intended to be that way, but the way that it is structured and the language that is used, it is open to misinterpretation, just as was the case with some aspects of children and young people's bill. Just like the name person, it is deeply unpopular with the public because they can see the glaring flaws all too clearly. Just like the name person policy, the legal responsibilities are confused and unclear. Just like the name person policy, the Scottish Government does not appear to be listening to the legal advice or to the police or to the many stakeholders who feel that it will be an intrusion into privacy, into personal choice and against free speech. These things all desperately matter because if we are to proceed with this bill as it is just now, we will be making bad law. And it is bad law that we cannot accept. And that is why on these benches, we would like the bill to be withdrawn and to start again so that we are listening, fully listening, to what the vast majority of stakeholders are saying about this bill. We need to have something that is not only good law, but it is workable and is accepted by the public. That is the key thing, and that is the message, Cabinet Secretary, which the Scottish Government has to take to its heart very quickly. I support the motion in the name of Liam Kerr. John Mason, to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, on this subject today. Uh, I have been taking quite an interest in this bill, and I have made my own submission to the Justice Committee. From a Christian perspective, we have a lot in the Bible about God's love for us and that we should reflect this by loving each other. Ultimately, that requires our hearts and attitudes to change on the inside, but I believe we as a parliament and as parliamentarians have a duty at least to restrain hatred in society, even if we cannot actually force anyone to love their enemy. Loving each other does not mean we are expected to agree with each other all the time, but God does want us to love each other and this means that we should want the best for the other person. That certainly includes, for example, Catholics and Protestants, who believe 95% of the same thing as each other. They are two parts of the one Christian faith, and Jesus prayed that his followers would all be one, and sadly we have not always been seeing that. One of the saddest aspects of modern Scotland for me is the continuing level of sectarian hatred, especially in Glasgow and the west of Scotland. We see a considerable level of hatred around Rangers and Celtic football matches, as well as connected to the many Orange or Loyalist and similar marches, and the fewer number of Irish Republican marches. Some of these appear to me to be attempting to stir up hatred against Catholics, Irish, and other communities. Sectarianism is a mixture of religion, race, history, politics, and culture. 
I am comfortable enough that the Bill does not use the word sectarianism, but rather deals with the characteristics of race and religion separately rather than together. However, this is a real and present-day area of hatred in our society, and we need to tackle it. I find it slightly disappointing that some Christian organisations seem to be more concerned about vague potential threats to their own rights somewhere in the future, rather than helping tackle expressions of actual hatred which we are seeing in our society today. Having said that, it seems to me that much of the bill is more about consolidating the existing law and does not seem to change things very much. Phrases like stirring up have been in the law since at least 1986 and do not seem to have caused a problem, as has been said. I think having to prove intent to stir up hatred is far too high a bar, but the Law Society has suggested a possible improvement by using words like significant risk, eh, and that would seem a positive way forward. Can I also say that I agree with the abolition of the offence of blasphemy? The church and the state should be separate, in my opinion. Eh, yes, they should each have a respect for the other, and they should not seek to interfere in each other's affairs. Looking specifically at the Conservative motion, I struggle to see what they are actually wanting. They say that hate crimes are, quote, a blight on society, but, quote, freedom of expression must never be compromised, unquote. Surely that is self-contradictory. At some time, there has to be compromise on freedom of expression. Surely they are not saying that it is acceptable for someone to stand up in our public square and state how much they hate black people or Jews or Muslims or Catholics or gypsy travelers and demand that these people rem be removed from our country or something worse than that. That is freedom of expression taken to an extreme and surely it must be curtailed. Other countries have made denying the Holocaust a crime, although we have not gone that far. But the point is that somewhere we have to draw a line between protecting freedom of expression on the one hand and restricting expressions of hatred which go too far on the other. The bill specifically protects freedom of expression in sections 11 and 12. So Patrick Harvey and I can continue to debate about who should or should not have sex with whom. We can discuss and criticise each other's ideas, even though we strongly disagree with each other. That is a sign of a healthy society and a healthy democracy. But what we must not do is seek to have the other and their views removed from the public square. There has to be compromise on both sides of this. We need to protect freedom of expression but we need to protect our vulnerable minorities. That is what this bill tries to do, and the Cabinet Secretary has repeatedly said he is open to improvements and amendments. So I'm left wondering what the Conservatives actually want. How do they envisage this, quote, legislation that is needed to tackle hate crime in Scotland? I He's think just closing. I haven't time, sorry. Uh, in Scotland. Legislation uh, that allows anyone to say anything? We need to hear more detail of what they actually want. So, Presiding Officer, I believe we have to tackle some of the extreme hatred we see in our society today. We also need to protect freedom of expression, and I think this bill makes a fair attempt to get the balance right. Therefore, I'm more than happy to see the bill progress. Removing it would be a signal that hatred is acceptable in modern society. Thank you. Adam Tomkins, followed by Shona Robson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in this Parliament, we are well underway with a stage one inquiry into an important piece of legislation which seeks at the same time both to protect and to limit free speech. That legislation is the defamation and malicious publication bill. The bill poses a question which is not at all easy to get right. To what extent should we protect the freedom to speak in such a way as damages another's reputation? The freedom of expression is a monumentally important value but it is not the only value we need to hold dear and to cherish. The right to privacy is likewise core to our sense of human dignity. And the law of defamation deals with one aspect of what happens when these two fundamental values clash. Where does my right to free speech end and your right to protect your reputation begin? Presiding officer, I have not been a member of the Parliament's Justice Committee for very long, but since becoming that committee's convener last month, I have been hugely impressed, if I can say this without embarrassing them, with the way in which the committee's members are going about their job of scrutinising the defamation bill. The questioning of witnesses has been forensic, diligent, informed, and has been designed throughout to shine light on rather than to generate heat about the issues the bill raises. 
I say all of this this afternoon for reasons that I hope are obvious. As with the defamation bill, so too does the hate crime and public order bill raise extremely sensitive questions about where and how this parliament wants to set the limits to freedom of expression. The Justice Committee will commence its stage one inquiry into the hate crime bill after the October recess, once we have completed our work on defamation. And I hope that the committee, and indeed, I hope that the whole of the parliament will consider and debate the issues of free speech in that bill uh, in exactly the same spirit as we are already doing in the defamation bill. Let us be forensic, diligent, and informed. Let us try to shine light on the issues rather than simply turn up the political heat. Certainly, presiding officer, that's the approach that I will be taking on the hate crime bill. I want to make two further points this afternoon. The first is a general one about how we should legislate on rights. But rights, presiding officer, should be broadly and generously construed, and limitations on the exercise of our rights should be narrowly and tightly construed. The burden of the argument always rests on those who wish to curtail rights, and the test is one of necessity unless and until it can be shown that it is necessary to restrict our fundamental liberties, the restriction should not be enacted. That's the approach that the Human Rights Act demands. That's the approach that the European Convention on Human Rights demands. And that's the approach that we, as responsible lawmakers, should take to the hate crime bill. And this leads me to my final point. If we fail to adopt this approach, of putting rights first and of insisting that any curtailment of our rights is as narrowly confined as possible. If we fail to do that, then we will find that our legislation on hate crimes suffers the same fate as the last parliament's legislation on named persons and offensive behavior at football. The named persons law was killed off in the courts. The offensive behavior at football legislation was repealed and reversed by this parliament. Let that not be the legacy we bequeath to our successors. If the hate crime bill fails to give sufficient protection to the fundamental right of freedom of expression, it will, in the end, fail. Either it will be quashed in the courts or it will be repealed by a more enlightened parliament in the future. We can do better than that, presiding officer. We can get it right first time. So let's learn the lessons of named persons and offensive behavior at football. And let's bring to the hate crime bill the same open-minded but clear-headed, robust and forensic scrutiny that we are already bringing to the defamation bill. And that way we can do what we have all been sent here to do, to make good laws for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Shona Robson, followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, as a member of the Justice Committee, I'm pleased to be able to take part in uh, this debate about the hate crime and public order bill. And I think it is important to remember the origins of the bill. It is a response to the recommendations made in Lord Brackadale's independent review of hate crime laws. And that is important. Um, the Scottish Government then consulted with the, the public on Lord Brackadale's recommendations. And it is worth noting that at that point, none of these concerns were raised, um, not least by those on the Conservative benches. Um, and I wonder why that is. Furthermore, at the time of the Brackadale recommendations being published, Liam Kerr, as the, the Tory Justice spokesperson, welcomed the bill saying, that it uh, makes 22 recommendations, many, many of which the Scottish Conservatives are pleased to endorse. And I agree absolutely uh, that all Scottish hate crime legislation should be consolidated. Many crimes currently fall into the category of hate crime and there are some overlaps, but there are also some gaps. So we went from a position of fairly broad consensus to where we are here in this debate today. And that somewhat puzzles me, I have to say because we are in a position now where the Conservatives are effectively, in a, in a moment, effectively calling for the scrapping 
of this bill, and I think that is indeed uh, very much a pity. Yeah, I'll give way. Oliver Mundell. I thank the member for giving way, but the fact that she's puzzled should point to the fact that a problem has occurred with this bill. We were supportive of those principles, but something has gone badly wrong in how this has been taken forward. Well, Shona Robson. I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that the issues, if you had those concerns, those concerns should have been expressed at the beginning of this process. You seem to have suddenly developed these concerns. And I just wonder if it's not more of a reaction to some of the publicity around this bill uh, that has seemed somewhat convenient uh, to jump on the bandwagon of. However, having said that, in a, in a spirit of consensus, because I think this debate uh, has had a large degree of consensus, there are problems with the bill uh, as drafted. No one is saying otherwise. And that has been acknowledged, not least by the Scottish Government themselves. Uh, they've engaged extensively with over 45 organisations and have said they'll pay close attention to the responses to the Justice Committee's call for evidence. Um, and that is how legislation has always been dealt with in this Parliament. There's nothing new or different about this bill. Many bills have gone through a process of, of quite extensive revision. That's what we're here to do, is it not? That's what the Justice Committee is here to do. The Scottish Government have said it will reflect on whether changes to the bill are required and have said that they want to seek common ground and compromise to ensure that effective legislation can be agreed that protects those affected by hate crime. So why would it be necessary, given all of that, to remove the bill? Are we not able to do that piece of work collectively and make it the bill that we can all agree with? I think we should. There's enough collective expertise in this parliament to do that briefly. Liam McCarthy. I thank, I thank the member for taking the intervention. Would she agree, that, and I, I, I agree with the sentiment she's laid out, would she agree that it would be helpful for the committee for those changes to be laid out before we embark on stage one oral evidence so we can actually t um, test those uh, proposals to destruction along with what is uh, already in the bill? Well, I, I think the Cabinet Secretary for Justice has said all along that he is very prepared to engage with the committee at all stages of this bill. It's in no one's interest to not try to build a, a consensus around uh, this bill. But we'd have to remember at the heart of this is a debate about hate crime. And the Cabinet Secretary reminded us that hate crime is on the rise and that there is an expectation outside of this Parliament that we do something about that. And that is the responsibility that we carry and need to remind ourselves when we get into some of the technical detail about this bill that actually what lies behind it are people who are suffering from hate crime day in, day out here in Scotland. So what do we do going forward? I think what we do is what happens with any piece of legislation in this place. Our job as legislators and parliamentarians is to get on with scrutinising the detail and yes, to listen to all sides of the debate, but not just to those voices that happen to be louder uh, than others. We need to listen to all voices in this debate, not least those who are at the receiving end of hate crime here in Scotland. And I do want to uh, end with Please. the uh, comments uh, that have been made by uh, victim uh, support uh, Scotland, Kate Wallace. If this bill is scrapped and it's not allowed to proceed through Parliament, it may be years before victims of hate crime have another chance to be given the protection that they deserve. We can't allow that to happen. That would be us failing in our duty as legislators and parliamentarians. So I speak in favour of Hamza Youssef's amendment. Uh, Johan Lamont, please, followed by Sandra Hoyt. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate. This bill is clearly contentious, and we should acknowledge that serious people have looked at this and have serious concerns. Now, I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has resisted the temptation simply to focus on parliamentary concerns and suggest that these are motivated entirely with party political considerations. Maybe Shona Robertson didn't get the memo, but it is important that you haven't gone to a comfort zone in to, in to support the bill by saying that those who are raising concerns um, should be delegitimised. Because the reality is that concerns go way beyond this parliament and are not so easily dismissed. 
And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to resist those framing the debate on this legislation as a false binary, that if you oppose this bill, you oppose equality and support hate crime. And it would not be on the wit of this Parliament if this bill fell to produce another piece of legislation that would address the concerns of victim support. Because to create this false binary closes down the debate on some very significant issues and insults many who are committed to a fairer society but are um, concerned about what well may be in unintended consequences. And in scrutinising the bill, I trust the Scottish Government will allow its own backbenchers to follow the evidence, recognise the role of the opposition to be challenging. There is no shame in getting a proposal wrong, but there is shame in digging in when these problems are highlighted, as we saw so clearly in the Offensive Behaviour Act that was dealt with in the past. Now, we have a long history in this Parliament in passing legislation to send a message or give a signal. That is not good enough. You should recognise the damage done if rights appear to exist but are not then enforceable. Legislation may be one part of changing lives, but a bill on its own will never be a substitute for education, investing in community organisation and supports that can challenge attitudes, create community safety and allow people to live free from fear, supporting people to have their voices heard. And sadly, the very organisations that support those who are very often victims um, of hate crime are, are seeing those organisations disappearing at local level. And I would ask that the Cabinet Secretary considers the budget choices that have been made that has led to those problems. Now, I do know what the argument about the exclusion of misogyny from the bill. As someone observed, if it was in the bill, the courts would be overrun. But of course, that quip is underpinned by a fundamental truth that women continue here and across the world to experience violence, denial of rights to education and employment and far more. And we would be deluding ourselves if we believed that a working group or an amendment to this bill at stage two will address the continuing inequality women face in all aspects of their lives. The concerns about this bill, particularly around stirring up hatred, are in the real world and in real time, and I shall give just one example. Women MSPs across party gathered in the Parliament to host meetings to discuss the implication of women's sex-based rights as enshrined in the Equality Act 2010 of proposals to reform the Gender Recognition Act. And I was proud to be involved in that. These were conducted inclusively with the greatest civility, thoughtfulness and respect. And yet, Patrick Harvey MST MSP still felt free to denounce the women involved as creating a situation where the Scottish Parliament was, and I quote, used as a platform for transphobic hatred and bigotry. Now, being lectured by a man is not unusual for a woman of my age, but in these circumstances, a fellow MSP sat as judge and jury on our actions, presuming, presumably, his perception of our actions would be sufficient for investigation. And people wonder why the stirring up provision creates anxiety, why women feel silenced in the face of potential court action. It's not good enough to say that those women would be able to make the case in court. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I, I fear perhaps that she has listened to those who, who lodged spurious complaints accusing me of inciting violence against lesbians uh, when I made that speech at the Pride Edinburgh event. There are absurd arguments on both sides of this debate. Let's dismiss all of them and listen only to those who bring sensible arguments to bear, not those who make such spurious allegations. If you it was come to a spurious, close, please, Ms. Lamont. It was not a spurious allegation to be accused of transphobic hatred and bigotry. And if this bill was an act, I may have been facing a charge in that regard. The fact of the matter, it is not so simple. When does legitimate debate, disagreement, a robust exchange of views become hatred? It cannot be sufficient to assume there is a common sense view that is self-evident. The law must be precise if we are not to see the very engine of change, the ability to debate and argument is silenced. Yes, the bill has problems. There are huge things that need to be addressed here. But the main message we should understand that in addressing hate crime in our communities, it is far more than the passing of a bill. It is about the support that we ensure is in our communities for those who live with that on a daily basis. Sandra White, please, followed by Graham Simpson. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, I'm, I'm 
I wouldn't say I'm delighted to be speaking in this debate, but I'm fortunate to be speaking in this debate. And I, I have listened very carefully to all the contributions. And I think on the whole, it's covered a fair amount. And on the whole, it's been a pretty good debate. And I've listened to everyone. And I think no matter what political party we belong to, I generally believe that we all agree that legislation does need to be brought together, which reflects the kind of Scotland we all want to live in, free from hatred, bigotry, discrimination and prejudice. Now, many of uh, my fellow MSPs have quoted from various agencies who have, have mentioned the fact that they're very, very supportive of this bill and uh, many organisations and individuals who wholeheartedly agree with the measures being proposed such as Inclusion Scotland, who kindly prepared a briefing, I think everyone got it, for members laying out the stark reality for people who have been victims of hate crime. And they stated, hate speech is not free speech. It has consequences for people who share the characteristics subjected to it. It impacts on their health and well-being and their human rights, including being able to go about their daily life to participate in society safely without fear of intimidation or harassment in the same way as everyone else. And I don't believe anybody here can actually argue with this statement. But I do, however, have great sympathy with those individuals and groups who fear that the bill as it stands does not provide clarity in certain areas. Uh, I've had many constituents email to write to me. I'm sure others have too. And they have raised concerns. And it's my duty as an MSP and their representative to raise these concerns here in the Parliament today. And I'll, I'll just give you some of the concerns, pieces of the information they have sent over. Um, although the bill is probably well-intentioned, I believe in its current format, it is flawed. According to this bill, one could easily be accused of stirring up hatred with absolutely no intention of doing so. I have no doubt that the legislation is well-intentioned, but its attempt to criminalise the use of words that could be deemed abusive and likely to stir up hatred would have a chilling effect on free speech. Yes? Sorry, John Finney. Uh, thank you very much, President. Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Would, would the member accept that Lord Brackadale, who's put a lot of work into this, said that extending the stirring up offences in Scotland would not infringe the Article 10 right to freedom of expression. That was in his report. Sandra I, certainly, I certainly take on board what John Finney has said, and I'm sure that any of constituents who are listening to this and have written this to me would take that on board also. But I do have genuine concerns, and I have listened to uh, what's been put forward, and I have asked questions, uh, you know, of various ministers, CABSEC, et cetera, et cetera, in regards to this also. And my concern is who defines stirring up or intention? And I have a lot of problems with that particular one. And I know that others have mentioned the fact that it would be a judge, etc., and it would go to court and, you know, basically. But the, nobody has said about somebody who is accused of that, who is innocent. It's not just something that happens within a couple of days. It can take months. So these are my concerns also, as well as some of the stuff I've read out from my constituents. And I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for listening to the concerns which have been raised throughout from every party and from myself, and in particular that of the intention to stir up hatred or likely to stir up hatred and respecting the freedom of speech. I mean, it is mentioned in the amendment from the Scottish Government. It recognises that there are concerns about aspects of the bill, including in relation to the stirring up of hatred offence provisions, which will benefit from further engagement with stakeholders and parliamentary scrutiny. I think that's a pretty honest statement, and I look forward to that parliamentary scrutiny, where issues that my constituents have asked, and I have asked also, can be put to the test of the committee and the parliament also. The presiding officer, we're in the very early stages of this piece of legislation. I believe the Scottish Government generally wants to work, and I know they do, with the other parties to find consensus, which provides real robust legislation that protects against hate crime. And really, we all need to come together to ensure we introduce legislation that is fit for purpose. But there's one thing we shouldn't do, we shouldn't ditch it. Thank you very much, presiding officer. 
The last of the open debate contributions is from Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a former journalist, I'm extremely alarmed by this bill. My view is that, as the Scottish Newspaper Society says, it poses a serious threat to freedom of expression. Parts of the bill are fine. The section removing the blasphemy offence from the statute book is sensible. But overall, the overall direction of travel in this bill is troubling. Let's be clear, though. Hatred is wrong. Hate crime is wrong. But you can't legislate for what people feel or think. You can legislate for their actions in words, spoken or written, and in their deeds. But we can't take away the fundamental right to express your opinions, even if it offends some people. I believe we should be free to say and write pretty much what we like and be dealt with by the law if we defame someone or stir up hatred. People have prejudices. It's part of being human. We like some people, we dislike others. Some people are to your liking and others aren't. Sometimes we might tell someone what we think of them. The right to insult people and to be insulted is surely something to hold on to. But under this bill, a really good insult could see you jailed. Under the section called Offences of Stirring Up Hatred, the bill says a person commits an offence if the person behaves in a threatening, abusive or insulting manner or communicates threatening, abusive or insulting material to another person. We could safely shut down the comedy sector in that case because I'm afraid there's no such thing as woke comedy. And if there was, I wouldn't like to see it. This bill is an attack on what you can say and what you can write. It's an attack on free speech, and that's sinister. We are in danger of heading towards an Orwellian state where everyone has to think the same. We've seen it recently, as Murdo Fraser has said, with the attacks on JK Rowling just for daring to express her view on gender issues. Well, good for her. And that's why I believe this bill should be scrapped and the government should go back to the drawing board. Now, Hamza Yousaf has, has achieved the extraordinary. He's managed to get lawyers, judges, the police, journalists, actors, writers, and even the broadcasters of the First Minister's daily party political sermon, BBC Scotland, against the bill. He has produced a deeply illiberal bill with woolly words like abusive, inflammatory and insulting, which as the Media Lawyers Association points out, are open to wide and subjective interpretation. Now when I worked in newspapers, everything I wrote was rightly subject to legal restrictions. But the Scottish Newspaper Society gives an example of how this bill could be used. They refer to a column about 10 years ago by Jan Moyer in the Daily Mail which referred to the death of boys' own singer Stephen Gately. The Press Complaints Commission rejected 25,000 complaints on the basis of freedom of expression. Miss Moyer's views that day were undoubtedly offensive, but they should not and should not have seen her hauled before the courts, as could be the result of this bill. I agree with the newspaper of society when it says only with absolute exceptions can legitimate journalism escape the scope of this legislation and even then there are no guarantees. Even if absolute exemptions create loopholes, we believe they would not outweigh blocking a legal route to close down controversial or unpopular opinions. I agree that this bill represents a clear threat to the freedom of the press. Newspapers should be free to publish without fear or favour. Columnists have to be free to offend. Editors have to be free to upset people, especially politicians, and to get things wrong. To publish headlines, and you wouldn't do this now, like the sun's hop off you frogs in a row with the French over British lamb. Presiding officer, it's time to call a halt to this bill and go back to the drawing board. I support the motion in Liam Kerr's name. Uh, before we move on to the closing speeches, I did say earlier um, that it would be necessary to move decision time as we were 
um, oversubscribed. So I would like to take a motion without notice under Rule 1124 to move decision time today to 5.30 p.m. And I would ask Miles Briggs to move that motion. Thank you very much. The motion is that we move decision time today to 5.30 p.m. Is everyone agreed? Thank you very much. And we move to the closing speeches. I call Willie Rennie for six minutes, please. Um, the, the professor set us the test, Adam Tompkins. He said, unless and until necessity is proven, rights should not be curtailed. And I think most of the afternoon, we've been considering that very seriously. I think actually it's been quite a, an enlightening debate for what could have been quite divisive. I think it's actually brought the chamber together in many ways. Um, I think the, it's not really because of the proposition, which was mostly for headlines, I, I suspect, about scrapping the bill altogether. I actually think there is a consensus now about amending the bill, and that's, that's a good thing. I think the, um, the Bemis, I think, summed it up well, that we should not be complacent because in Scotland it's not immune uh, to racism or prejudice. And I think it should be clear that if anybody who wants to indulge in, in hateful speech to try and incite that, then they should not draw comfort um, from this debate. There is no excuses in Scotland for such activity and they should stop and they should know this parliament is united against it. Hate is poisonous, it's degrading, it's oppressive, it stabs at the heart of a liberal society. And free speech, I think, enhances it. Liam MacArthur, in, in drawing inspiration from Lord Justice Sedley, said, free speech includes not only the inoffensive, but the irritating, the contentious, the eccentric, the heretical, the unwelcome, and the provocative. And he was not talking about Mike Crumbles by himself. <laughs> um, this was about freedom only to speak inoffensively is not worth having. So you know, I think Liam MacArthur also summed it up well in terms when he said, in an attempt to make bad people nicer, we should not be making good people criminals. So that sets, I think, the context um, for this debate. And I have to pay credit to the minister because I think he does deserve credit, because he's come here today accepting that his bill might not be perfect. Accepting that people, and he said this, have got legitimate concerns. And I think he's right to acknowledge that, because there's been 2,000 submissions. It's been a humongous number of people who've made submissions to this. When it can unite, as it's been said before, the humanists with the church, comedians with the faculty of advocates, and the police federation, then this parliament's got to sit up and pay attention and acknowledge that it might not be right and we might seek, need to seek to change it. And I think Hamza Yusuf, when he said, it was this is a simple transfer of a provision that's been in law in terms of race um, for some time, and we're simply transferring that over to hate. Yet we heard a number of different organisations who've got deep concerns about how that transfer is happening. So we need to scrutinise that in much greater detail. Because although it's right to try and consolidate all the various pieces of legislation in regards to hate, there is obviously something that's concerning a considerable number of people. And Murdo Fraser, who I thought made a, a very good speech, considered speech, when he talked about proving intent in contrast with proving the likelihood to stir up. Again, another bit at the heart of this debate that we need to consider very seriously. Is that contrast between intent and likelihood at the heart of this? And I thought John Mason, when he made a, an intervention, when he highlighted that there are possible routes out of this, when he talked about significant risk instead of using that terminology. And that might be something the committee needs to consider. And then when Rhoda Grant talked about um, the language, the loose language, the vague language, might be catching more than just hate crime. Again, a good contribution and needs to be considered. Because the Law Society say that the provisions were unduly wide on, and considered new offences. Um, it restricted potentially freedom of expression. It lacked clarity and policy justification. So specific concerns that they had that we should be addressing. And Scottish Pen said there was a substantial expansion in the criminal law. 
So this is not just, it seems, a tidying up exercise. It seems to be a major change in the law. So it's right, I think, and this is about the way forward. And I don't think Liz Smith was right when she said that because we got it wrong on name person doesn't mean we're going to get it wrong on every other law. We can get it right. We can, uh, we can actually use the committee processes to improve. So I don't think because we got it wrong on something that could be similar that we're going to get it wrong on this as well. Uh, yes, very briefly. Liz Smith. Just making the point, Mr Rennie, that one of the reasons we got it wrong is because we weren't listen, listening to the advice that we were given at the time. And that's what we're advising this time, that we listen properly to the advice that we don't make bad law. I can absolutely agree with that, but that doesn't mean you have to scrap the whole bill. I think you can use the committee process in order uh, to improve it. Um, I don't think, uh, seriously, that the proposal to dump the bill would be a constructive way ahead, because it wouldn't just be months. It would be years that we'd be talking about before we would come back to it. It's been years in the making through the Lord Brackadale process. Are we really going to wait even more time in order to try and get this right? But John Mason did give me some inspiration. In fact, Sandra White did as well, because she came forward with suggestions, and so did John Mason, about how we could improve this. She had an open mind about changing the bill to make it better. And of course, also we should have encouragement that the misogyny provisions might come forward in a standalone proposition and defence. So my suggestion today, and our party is in support of changing section two in a substantial way and we want that to come before stage one because this would be a major change in the purpose of the bill and would require substantial scrutiny before we go forward to the other stages it can't be shoehorned in to stage two and that would be my final plea to the minister to make that a consideration in his summing up thank you now, I don't want us to be any later than half past five so John Finney up to six minutes please Expecting to close. Okay. That took you by surprise, Mr. Finney. <laughs> Patrick Harvey. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The, uh, the Conservative uh, position yeah. today is clearly, of course, contradictory. Liam Kerr talks about the volume of uh, 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 submissions that have been made on this bill and says that they deserve proper scrutiny, while Douglas, Douglas Ross has been quoted clearly as saying he wants the bill scrapped once and for all. Scrapped once and for all. That, that would not give us the opportunity to take any of these submissions seriously. And this, of course, comes from a party leader notorious for having said that if he was Prime Minister for a day, getting tough on gypsy travellers would be his top priority. So let's, let's just recognise where some of these arguments are coming from. Uh, and I have to say as well uh, to, to Mardo Fraser that I'm afraid I don't have very much interest uh, in hearing uh, his concerns uh, that others are being silenced when just this, week, just this week, he has been questioning the funding of pro-equality organisations in Scotland, the same pro-equality organisations who have campaigned for my human rights and equality, which he has consistently voted against pretty much every time it's come up in this chamber. Uh, so I don't have any more interest uh, in hearing that argument any more than I do in debating with John Mason about who other consenting adults should or shouldn't have sex with. It's not my business, it's not John Mason's, and thank goodness for that. <laughs> the, the Labour position, uh, the Labour position uh, I think, goes slightly too far. The, the, the amendment from Labour uh, says substantial revision is necessary for the bill to be fit for purpose. Clearly, there, there is scope for constructive amendments for this bill. But I contrast that uh, with the, the position taken by James Kelly when he was still Labour's justice spokesperson, saying that the bill was an attack on free speech, uh, that it was more of a threat to society than a benefit, uh, and promoting absurd Daily Mail claims that a, a, a US religious right lobbyist was a, a UN human rights expert commenting uh, on this bill. I'm very glad that there were some Labour speeches today that took a very different uh, position, including the very excellent speech from Mary Fee, uh, which I think was uh, something that struck the right nuanced approach that we should all uh, bear in mind. There are, of course, areas where this bill can be improved. And the, the issue of misogynistic harassment is an obvious one. Of course, for many years, as Rhoda Grant and Liam Kerr uh, both acknowledged, there has been a wide range of views about misogynistic harassment uh, or about uh, uh, misogyny, uh, misogyny as a, an aggravated grounds uh, for other offences uh, or some other approach. 
that range of views, including from the women's and feminist movement in Scotland, has been very broad uh, for many, many years. That hasn't prevented us from legislating with consensus on hate crime in the past. And if we are moving now toward a consensus with those organisations support a standalone offence, I would very much welcome that. But killing off this bill would close down the opportunity that we have uh, to debate it. Um, the, the language in the stirring up offences, of course, has been subject to a lot of debate, including uh, from, from Liz Smith, uh, for example. Uh, but some seem to suggest that the language in the stirring up offence is new. As, as my colleague John Penny made very clear, it's not. It's decades old. And if we're going to model something on legislation which clearly works, which has clearly not been overused or misused, and which is clearly ECHR compliant, then I think we're on broadly safe ground. And we can look at variations on, on how that wording uh, is set out, and we can look at caveats that might be debated. But to suggest that this is some radical departure from what we've already been doing for decades, uh, I, I don't think is reasonable. Um, the, um, the, the point that I think came from almost every speaker, and certainly from every political party, was a general statement to the effect that we all take hate crime very seriously and we all want to tackle it and challenge it. I think we also need to recognize and acknowledge that that consensus is not universal. There are indeed uh, people who perpetrate racism, misogyny, religious hatred, homophobia, transphobia. These phenomena are real and there are also organizations actively seeking to propagate those things. It's been said that some of this is open to misinterpretation. Well, perhaps yes, but perhaps some of that is willful misinterpretation. And I would certainly say, uh, in relation to Joanne Lamont's comments, uh, that if we're concerned with freedom of speech, if we are concerned with freedom of speech, and someone who has already been excluded from social media platforms for hateful conduct is called out for transphobia, then both people have exercised their freedom of speech. Both people have exercised their freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is, of course, a democratic cornerstone, as others have said. But is it an absolute? No, it never has been. And in any case, Article 10 will stand. It will still be there, ECHR protections. And if, I, I don't expect it, but if we pass this legislation or something like it, and it is found in future to breach ECHR, then it can be struck down. Because this parliament has that protection, which Westminster doesn't, that we cannot pass legislation that is unlawful. I hope we're in a position where we wouldn't even have a government seeking to introduce legislation that's unlawful, even if only in a specific and limited way. And it's the UK government, I would remind colleagues, it's the UK government which just in the last week has also been subject to a level two alert on press freedom, not this government uh, or this parliament. Um, this has been a long story, presiding officer, and wrapping up, from uh, pre-devolution legislation through to the sectarianism work in session one, the working group on hate crime in session two, my own bill on aggravated offences in session three, uh, the OBFA in session four, which was not subject to consultation, which was rushed uh, and which left a cluttered and fragmented landscape even more cluttered and fragmented, through to the Brackadale review in session five, which does the consolidation work, which is now more than a decade overdue. I think it's important that we take that scrutiny forward. Uh, this is overdue already. Douglas Ross might want to kill it off for shallow partisan reasons. We should not. I support the amendment uh, in my colleague John Penny's name. Alec Crowley for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, despite the difficulties with this bill, I think it has been a fairly positive debate today and that uh, there is consensus in this chamber that our country is no place for hate and we should work towards being an inclusive and welcoming nation to all races, religions, gender, sexualities and abilities. Prejudice has no place in 21st century Scotland and we all need to work together to play our part and educate current and future generations on why it is wrong to discriminate. The Labour Party has always been at the forefront of making our country a more equal place and we will continue to support measures that highlight inequality and tackle discrimination in all forms. However, whilst we are in agreement that there is no place for hate in society, 
the bill in its current form would not be fit for purpose. We welcome the commitment to consolidate hate crime offences. However, part two of this bill will require, in our view, substantial revision before being acceptable. And I do hope that the Government and Cabinet Secretary will take on board the many, many concerns, some of which I will highlight today. We will support the principle of the bill, but urge the Government to, back, to get back to the table, to involve all the stakeholders who have raised their concerns in order to fix the many problems that have come to light with the passage of the bill. While we do want the bill to be robust in how it deals with legitimate hate crime, it must also protect the rights we enjoy with regard to free speech, as has been highlighted by a considerable number of members in here today and indeed submissions in the call for views on the bill. In broader terms, it is useful to consolidate our legislation on hate crime. And as the Equality Network, LGBT Youth Scotland and Stonewall Scotland have pointed out, it is currently inconsistent with less protection for some groups of people who face hate crime than others. And in places, the language and definitions are outdated. Bringing together the various offences and updating the language into modern working pieces of legislation has to be welcomed. And this bill should not have become so controversial and had the go government listened to the many stakeholders who expressed deep concerns, then we may not have been here today. The problematic areas within the bill are casting a shadow over the good elements it contains, which in turn is creating confusion around the commitment to tackle hate crime, which I'm sure we are all committed to. For example, the Law Society of Scotland has raised concerns about the new offence the bill will create, and they state these provisions seem unduly wide without any specification provided as to the actual type of offending conduct that is intended to be criminalised. Criminal law must have certainty about the offending conduct it prohibits and intends to sanction by way of penalties. That is because the effect of a criminal conviction regarding any individual's life, such as a career and plans to travel, may be significant. The Scottish Police Federation has said that they have concerns the bill seeks to criminalise the mere likelihood of stirring up hatred by creating an offence of threatening, abusive or insulting behaviour, such offence to include both speech and conduct. This complicates the law and is, in their opinion, too vague to be implemented. The National Secular Society has simply called the new law on stirring up hatred unnecessary. So I would urge the government to listen to all the views being expressed on the bill and be open with amending this legislation so that it can be considered fit for purpose and achieve support across the country. The useful parts of the bill which have support from most organisations cannot be lost due to the poorly worded and poorly conceived elements. I hope that once amended, this bill can achieve the support that a bill tackling hate crime deserves, but that will not be the case unless the government makes considerable changes and helps alleviate the genuine concerns being raised. I would also pick up the point that Liam MacArthur made and ask the Cabinet Secretary to consider at which point he's going to bring forward changes so that the committee will be able to look at what the changes are that are being proposed. I would like to close, presiding officer, by quoting from the briefing circulated by the Equality Network, as I think it fittingly sums up. They state, now is the time for MSPs of all parties who agree that hate crime needs to be addressed to use the process of debating and amending this bill so that we can end up with an act that deals with the blight of hate crime while preserving our freedom of speech. Freedom and protection from hate crime are not opposites. They can and should go 
hand in hand. And hopefully, with the spirit that's in this chamber today, that's what we can achieve. Hamza Yusuf, up to seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, when uh, I came to learn that uh, the opposition business uh, today would be on hate crime, I was afraid that there would be uh, more heat than, than there would be light. I, I'm pleased that those fears have been unfounded. I think it's been a very good debate, uh, a very illuminating debate, and we've discussed some uh, very lofty principles of legal jurisprudence by, by, by Liz Smith, uh, and also some, some very important philosophical principles uh, by a number of members right across the chamber, and that is uh, right in this uh, kind uh, of deba debate. When I also heard the debate was going to be on, on, on hate crime, again, my concern was that there would be a, a lot of division. Um, I, I'm pleased again to say that those fears were unfounded. There has actually been a huge degree of consensus. I just take some of the areas of consensus that I've picked up, but members can challenge me if they feel I'm wrong. One is that, by and large, we agree with the need for hate crime legislation to protect those who are often the targets of hate. So we agree generally with the principles of the bill. Uh, we, are, we all agree that there are uh, challenges and concerns that have been expressed uh, about the bill. Most of those focused on the stirring up uh, offences, but not exclusively. And so therefore there's an onus on government to come forward to express and articulate what we can do to try to uh, mitigate some of those fears. There's, I think, generally a, a general consensus, uh, maybe, not, maybe not unanimity, but a general consensus that the government should come forward uh, and articulate the areas that they are prepared to compromise on and to do so before the committee takes oral evidence. And that's a commitment I'm happy uh, to give. Um, and there is, again, general consensus, again, not unanimity, because the Conservatives aren't quite in this space, but general consensus amongst everybody else that we should absolutely not withdraw the bill and that we have faith ultimately in ourselves as parliamentarians and legislators to be able to work through those difficult challenges, those stakeholder contributions, and at the end of it, as Alex Rowley has just said, come out with a bill that both will protect that cornerstone of democracy, which is freedom of speech, and also protect people's right not to be the targets of hatred. And the two are not mutually exclusive. I give way to Alistair Allen. Alistair Allen. I, I thank uh, Cabinet Secretary for giving way. And uh, as he did uh, give way, he, he touched on a point I was going to touch on, which is, is to point out, as he'll be aware um, from his time as Islands Minister, um, how important religion is to many of my constituents. Can he give an assurance that this bill, as it is put forward in its final form, as far as the government's concerned, will and can both protect people from hatred and protect people's rights to hold and express differing religious views. Hamza Yusuf. I, I can. I can give that categorical uh, assurance. And, and, and Alistair Allen's right. He, he and I, I think the last time I was uh, in his constituency, we travelled to uh, the first ever mosque uh, built on an island. So I know the importance of uh, religion, many religions that are practised uh, on our islands. I am a person uh, of faith uh, myself, and nobody should be criminalised for their religious belief, hence why uh, the tests in this bill are very, very high when it comes to the stunning up offences. They are that the behaviour has to be threatening or abusive, or the communication, and I'm not including the racial stunning up offence, which has been around uh, since, since 1986, but for the other offences that we're looking to create, the other stunning up offences, so the behaviour has to be threatening uh, or abusive and has to have the intention or likelihood to stir up uh, hatred. And I will come to the likelihood point because a number of uh, members across the chamber have raised concern about the likely threshold. A number of stakeholders also have raised concern around, around the likely uh, threshold. Um, I, I would say it's not entirely unique to, to the United Kingdom. I think Lee MacArthur suggested uh, that threshold isn't used at all. It is used in Northern Ireland uh, uh, when, when it comes to the various uh, stunning up offences they have on race, uh, religion, sexual orientation, and disability, if my memory serves me uh, correct. But I do recognize that there's concerns around that threshold. As uh, I think John Mason pointed out, there can be challenges uh, in, in, in a court in proving somebody's intent. But all of that said, let me give a very clear indication to the chamber today that that is one area that I will reflect on uh, and take away to see if I can give uh, some element uh, of uh, assurances. 
Of course I will. Liam Kerr. Just on that exact point, uh, is he able to give any form of time scale? Because I think Liam MacArthur made the point several times. You know, the, the sooner we get that concrete movement, the better, and I think the, the happier the Chamber will be. Hamza Yousaf. I, I can promise him that I'm working on that at pace. I, I have had a number of discussions with some stakeholders. I, I will do that before uh, the committee uh, intends to take uh, oral evidence. And as soon as I can do that, uh, I promise him I absolutely will. Um, I think it is important uh, to also give some assurances to the points raised by Ruth McGuire, by Joanne Lamont, uh, and, and many others, I think, across the chamber when it comes to the issues uh, of a potential uh, sex aggravator. Uh, the reason uh, why uh, we use the term sex aggravator aligns with uh, the Equality Act uh, 2010, but it was very strong representations, not just from uh, the national women's organisations, uh, of which I have a great respect for, but when I met then also with local uh, providers uh, of, uh, sorry, local, local feminist organisations uh, and groups that work with women, they were also of the view that the best way to address the issue of misogynistic harassment was not through an aggravator uh, or indeed a stirring up offence, but actually through a standalone uh, offence. And what I would say to uh, Joanne Lamont and, and again hopefully to, to Ruth McGuire on this is that simply expressing a view that some may find offensive or even insulting wouldn't meet the threshold for prosecution. Your behaviour would have to be, for the stirring up offence, would have to be threatening or abusive and also with the intent or likelihood to stir up hatred. And it would have to meet both those tests. And generally speaking, I think all of us have engaged uh, in very robust debate in our times as parliamentarians Generally speaking, I think most of us would recognise if our behaviour was threatening or abusive or indeed with the intent uh, or likelihood um, of stirring up hatred. But I can give Joanne Lamont and, and, and Ruth McGuire and the others who have raised this point a very clear assurance uh, that it is an issue that I will reflect on uh, again uh, further. I am, uh, I know, uh, out of time, uh, presiding officer. I know this has been, I, I think this has been uh, a really excellent uh, debate. What I would say um, to the Conservatives is, just again, it is barely three months ago that we stood here uh, united in our, uh, and, and rededicated ourselves uh, against uh, anti-racism and against prejudice. I think it's hugely important that we don't withdraw the bill. I do believe in our own abilities to scrutinise uh, the bill, amend the bill where necessary, and come forward with a piece of legislation that both protects freedom of speech, but also equally protects those who are often the targets of hatred, and I move the amendment uh, in my name. I now call on Donald Cameron to close the debate and take us up to our decision time. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Uh, the phrase freedom of expression is used the world over it. Like many well-worn phrases, it perhaps suffers from overuse, with its meaning sometimes being lost. Freedom of expression, something we all support, but don't often debate. What does it mean? Well, I would say this, but in my view, the best exposition is a legal one. It's found in Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which says this, everyone has the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority and regardless of frontiers. It is not an unlimited right. Patrick Harvey was right to say that. It's like many fundamental rights. It's qualified. There are circumstances where the state can impose restrictions. In short, there is a balance to be struck, a balance between allowing free expression and constraining it at certain moments. But its purity, as both a guiding principle in any democracy and an essential liberty we all enjoy, is paramount. It is a human right in the original basic sense of those words, a fundamental freedom to be cherished by every human being. Given that, we have to be cautious and careful about legislating in this area. It is very difficult territory. And in recent years, uh, for some examples, there have been a number of public protests in Scotland which illustrate these difficulties where conduct of protesters may be abusive or threatening and intended or likely to stir up hatred. We've seen banners at the border saying, England, get out of Scotland. We've seen banners at independence marches saying, Tory scum out. Now the former example, could arguably be caught by the bill, given it is related to race. The latter example would not be caught, because, as I would be the first to accept, 
This bill does not seek to criminalise conduct by reference to political opinion. And I, for one, would defend till my dying day the right of those people to carry that banner without threat of criminal sanction, notwithstanding the offensive message it contains to someone of my political persuasion. But they're examples which reveal not just the importance of freedom of expression, but the complexities of the legislation when applied to real life and the problems of enforcement they bring. It's clear we are sailing very, very close to the wind here. The strength of feeling on this bill is palpable, and we've heard criticisms from many. Uh, the campaign group Free to Disagree have conducted opinion polling on the bill, and they say that only, over two-thirds of Scots agreed that for a criminal offence to be committed, there must be a proven intention to stir up hatred. And that's a point I'll return to shortly. And as others have noticed, there are widespread concerns among many in civic society about the impact of this legislation. The Faculty of Advocates, a body whose detailed response I commend, I note John Finney quoted from them, has warned it will restrict freedom of expression and it may cause the invasion of privacy and domestic life. The Scottish Police Federation have said the bill could affect the legitimacy of the police in the eyes of the public. That's a very stark comment. These aren't anxieties from the fringe, presiding officer. They're not minor worries. They are serious, legitimate, and credible concerns posed by many in society. As others have said, there are some parts of this bill which are not objectionable. The bill attempts to consolidate the plethora of hate crime offences into one act. It seeks to abolish the common law of blasphemy. These are sensible measures. But the issues in part two are many, and in our view, fatal to the bill's prospects. They fail the test of being simple and clear and instead are vague and confusing. Here, forgive me if I veer into some of the more technical legal issues. First, the fact that this offence can be committed by intention, but also if it is likely that hatred can be stirred up. In other words, it's an offence which can be committed without the requisite mens rea, the mental element, which the criminal law usually requires. That's not terminal. Scots criminal law contains several offences which have no mental element. But given the absence of the statutory defence which the 86 Act does contain, it's a concerning omission. And both Willie Rennie and Murdo Fraser made this point, and I note the Cabinet Secretary's commitment in that regard. Second, the fact that stirring up... I'm sorry, I, I've, I've already limited my time. Second, the fact that stirring up hatred in terms of race includes the words insulting, but stirring up hatred in terms of other characteristics does not. The bill must be consistent. I regret that's one of the bracketed recommendations which the government hasn't, uh, has ignored. Third, the reasonableness defence reverses the burden of proof. Now, that's a very significant step in terms of the criminal law. The onus is placed, albeit partially, on the accused to prove they acted reasonably. And that, as others have said, is inappropriate. Fourth, the reference to freedom of expression in uh, sections 11 and 12 are insufficient. And why are only two protected characteristics singled out here, so, sexual orientation and religion? Why does the Faculty of Advocates say the current wording does not appear to afford significant protection? There were many good speeches in this debate, presiding officer. Rhoda Grant, Joanne Lamont, Leah MacArthur, Ruth McGuire, to name but a few. I entirely take at face value the Scottish Government's motivation behind this bill. I've read carefully what the Justice Secretary has said and written about his own experiences as an individual. And I acknowledge that above and beyond those personal experiences, he rightly, as do many, as do all of us, sees hate crime as a blight that exists across wider society. Willie Rennie said, hate is poisonous, hate crime is pernicious, it is intolerable. It causes deep, deep harm to its victims and to the wider communities uh, indirectly affected. And I've never doubted the sincerity with which Hamza Yusuf has pursued this, and I have never questioned his commitment in wanting to eradicate hate crime from Scotland. And it's in that spirit that these benches make this appeal. It's an appeal for the government to reconsider at this stage, before we enter into the mechanics of parliamentary process, which, as Liam Kerr has pointed out, may be rushed, may be affected by a number of external factors, may simply be inadequate in the time left before dissolution. We appeal for the Cabinet Secretary to pause, to draw breath, to pull back from the brink, to pull back the bill, because the law as drafted goes too far. It is undoubtedly an attack on free speech. In our view, it is too broken to fix. Public confidence in this legislation is critical. And a damaging narrative is built up around this bill, which sadly obscures the good intentions behind it. Ultimately, this bill has lost the confidence of the public, 
and that is why we must start again. Thank you, President. Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. That concludes our debate on the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of Legislative Consent Motion 22670 on the Fisheries Bill, UK legislation. Could I call on Fergus Ewing to move this motion? Formally moved. Thank you very much. The question on this will be put at decision time. The next item is consideration of Business Motion 22655 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business motion. Could I call on Graeme Day to move this motion? Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Now, no member has indicated the wish to speak on this motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 22655 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, thank you. The next question is uh, consideration of business motion 22656 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the stage one timetable for a bill. Again, could I call on Graham Day to move? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. And again, no member has asked to speak on this motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 22656 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, thank you. The next item is consideration of nine Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I call on Graeme Day to move motions 22657 on designation of a lead committee and 22658 to 22661 and 22663 to 22666 on approval of an SSI? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. The question on that motion, or those motions, will be put at decision time. So we're going to turn to decision time now. And I'm going to begin by calling the outstanding votes from yesterday, Tuesday the 8th of September, uh, before I call today's business. So the first question is that Amendment 22635.2 in the name of Alison Johnston, which seeks to amend motion 22635 in the name of Jean Freeman on the Baroness Cumberledge report be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I will check online. The second question is that motion 22635 in the name of Jean Freeman as amended on the Baroness Cumberland report be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Turning to today's business, I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Hamza Youssef is agreed, the amendment in the names of Rhoda Grant and Lee MacArthur will fall. So the first question is that Amendment 22636.4 in the name of Hamza Youssef, which seeks to amend Motion 22636 in the name of Liam Kerr on the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. So we're going to move to a division on this amendment. Uh, what's going to happen is we're going to go into a short technical break to make sure that all members, uh, both in the chamber and remotely, uh, have the voting app open and are ready to uh, vote. So we're going to go for a short break and I suspend this meeting temporarily.
Can you go back? Thank you very much, colleagues. We're now going to resume uh, proceedings. And I would remind members that we are dividing on an amendment, double two six three six point four, in the name of Hamza Youssef, which seeks to amend the motion double two six three six in the name of Liam Kerr on the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill. Members may now cast their votes. This will be a one minute division. Following the division, there will be a big pause to allow any members who do not think their vote has been registered to make that point known to me. The vote is now closed. I would encourage any member in the chamber who does not believe their vote was registered to let me know now by making a point of order. And I would similarly encourage any members that are online who do not believe their vote was recorded to enter, uh, to make that, their views known in the chat room. I will get that message and I will uh, ask them to make a point of order. Did you get a message that said that? Thank you, colleagues. I've allowed as much time as possible to allow all members online and in the chamber to make it clear if they think they had not registered their vote. The result of the vote on amendment number 22636.4 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes, 58, no, 55. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now, the preemption means that the amendments in the name of Rhoda Grant and Lee MacArthur fall. So the next question is that the, the, amend, the motion in the name... Oh, yes. Found the right page. The next question is that amendment 22636.2 in the name of John Finney 
which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Liam Kerr be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We're going to move to division once more. Members may cast their votes now. That vote is now closed. I would take the opportunity, opportunity to remind members in the chamber and online that if they do not believe their vote has been registered, to let me know now. And there will be a pause to allow members to do so. Thank you very much, colleagues. I've given members as long as I can to uh, challenge if they didn't think their vote was recognised or registered. The result of the vote on amendment number 223632 in the name of John Finney is yes, 31, no, 30. There were 58 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now, the next question is that motion 22636 in the name of Liam Kerr as amended on the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division on the amended motion in the name of Liam Kerr. M members may cast their votes now.
Can I ask Ms. Boyack, I can see Ms. boyack has got an issue here. Could I ask her if she wishes to make a point of order about the way she voted? Yes. Point of order from Sarah Boyack. Yeah, I don't think my vote was counted. I'm can Ms. Sure. Boyack just clarify which way she voted in that division? I voted yes. Voted yes. I'll make sure that Ms. Boyack's vote is added to the voting tool. Point of order. Point of order from Daniel Johnson. Just to say exactly the same things, I'm not convinced my vote was registered and that would have been a yes. Very well. Daniel Johnson also makes a point of order to ensure his vote is recorded. When members vote and press vote, they should see a page which says you have voted. Point of order from Rona Mackay. Same thing. Um, I don't think I've been okay. registered. I beg your pardon. I should just clarify to Daniel Johnson, first of all, did Daniel Johnson say he voted yes? He did. Okay. And in Rona Mackay? Yes. Yes. Voted yes. Yeah. Point of order from Neil Findlay. Sign officers, this system is, people are making, you're making a sweeping assumption that the people who didn't vote is down to this technical problem, something wrong with, they may have not voted for another reason, as many people have, including myself, over the years, it has been my error. We have no idea if people have not voted because of a technical reason. And every time we're doing this, the integrity of what we're trying to do is being eroded. We cannot proceed on this basis. This is madness. Can I thank Mr Finlay for the point? That's not a point of order for this vote. However, his points are noted. Uh, I would stress that um, both Rona Mackay and Daniel Johnson's votes had been recorded. However, Sarah Boyks had not been recorded. And it is now amended. Thank you, colleagues. The result of the vote on motion double two six three six in the name of Liam Kerr as amended is yes eighty nine, no thirty. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion double two six seven zero in the name of Fergus Ewing on the Fisheries Bill UK legislation be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I propose to ask a single question on the nine parliamentary bureau motion. Does any member object? No. The question is that motions 22657 to 22661 and 22663 to 22266 in the name of Graham Day and behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business. We'll just have a short pause while members uh, leave the chamber and I'd ask them to do so quietly and observe social distancing while doing so, please.